Okay, great. So um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Thursday, October 8th, 2020 uh, meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, uh, the chair of the school committee. Uh, this meeting is being held um, as an online Zoom meeting uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law issued on March 12th. Um, this meeting is being audio and video recorded and it will be um, rebroadcast on, on Northampton Open Media um, at a future date. Um, just in terms of um, in terms of Zoom etiquette, if folks could please just uh, mute themselves um, uh, until we're in the public comment period when I will then ask people to raise their hands um, and I'll go through, the, uh, go through the list of folks in the order in which your hands are raised uh, for public comment. And um, again, if you could mute yourself um, for the rest of the meeting um, until, unless, unless and until you're called upon to speak. So um, let's begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll call of the school committee. Mayor, uh, Mayor Narkowitz. Present. Report. Member Busansky. Present. Member Fallon. Present. <laughs> Member Seraphie Cox. Present. Member Condon. Present. Member Levy. Member Levy. Present. Member Kaufman. Present. Member Goldman. Present. Member Voss. Present. Member Gold. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Excellent. Thank you. So the first item on this evening's agenda is the public comment period. Um, and uh, again, I would ask people to mute. I'm actually going to mute everyone um, and um, sort of clear the decks there. Um, just be mindful of your mute buttons. Um, and so what I, would, what I would ask people is that if you wish to speak during the public comment period, we will allot you uh, three minutes and I'll ask you to uh, state your name and where you live uh, for the record. Um, if you are on Zoom, uh, you use the raise hand function. Um, if you're calling in on a telephone, uh, you can use the phone functions, uh, which I believe star uh, nine raises your hand. So if you need to raise your hand on a phone call, that's how you would do it. So, um, I'll begin the public comment period by calling on the first uh, person who has their hand raised. Um, I'll um, ask them to unmute and uh, again, state their name and where they live for the record. The first person signed up is Jeff Jones. Jeff, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Narkowitz. Um, Jeff Jones, 76 Woods Road. Uh, Northampton Ward 6. Um, proud parent still of my daughter who graduated from Northampton High School last year. Um, I'm here tonight uh, because I also, um, as a staff representative from UFCW Local 1459, represent the school bus drivers uh, for Durham School Services. And I know you have an item on your agenda um, the last agenda that I saw about an MOA, and I'm just here to urge um, the council to uh, pass um, that MOA. I am unclear as to what the particulars are because uh, we were kept out of the process, but I'm here to represent um, the drivers um, that, are, that drive those buses. They're extremely hardworking people. Uh, we're all dealing with a difficult pandemic situation. Um, and at this point, we're trying to, um, to scramble to keep the unit intact. And I believe we went through a version of this last spring. And I think this fall, we're basically in the same position. Um, I hope the, the committee is able to reach resolution tonight. Um, I'm not able to stick around this meeting because I have another engagement. 
myself, but that's about all I have to say. And thank you for your hard work, because I know this is a, it's a, it's a, in so-called normal times, it's hard um, to serve this function on school committee. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for your comments. Um, the next person whose hand is raised is Sharon Deal. Sharon, you can unmute. And Hi folks, my name is Sharon Deal. I live at 57 Baker Hill in Florence. Um, this is, I'm in my 25th year of teaching and I'm a teacher at JFK Middle School. I'm a special education teacher, which means I am more or less in-person teaching. Um, so that being said, I wanna say that I'm also remote because only 30% of my students decided to be in person and the rest of them are remote. Um, the MOA that was developed in the summer um, was really written before um, COVID was really discussed about being an airborne aerosol virus. So I'm asking you to look at that. I'm asking you also to look at the trends in the last two weeks, we've had a 13% increase with positive tests for children. DESE has reported um, over the last, from 924 to 930, 61 um, positive students and 35 teachers. Just this past week, 106 students across the state and 57. So that's an increase for students of 73% and an increase for teachers of 63%. My next question to you is, is the filtration and air ventilation system report, is, is that the, is that, are those numbers real? And I, I, I need some clarification about, are those numbers real? And I think it's important for the public to know that many of the buildings um, might not just be all that safe. And I think that needs to be released to the public so that the public can make a decision about what they want to do for their own children. Um, I also think that um, at JFK, I teach in room 229. The wireless, since we've been back, has been terrible. Uh, the kids are dropping calls constantly and can't upload the videos. So I think that needs to get taken looked at. The other thing is um, my room was 49 degrees and I'm going to say it again, 49 degrees. I had gloves and a jacket on. So the solving the problem with the dampers open doesn't really solve the problem. So please take a look at that. Um, I bought my own personal HEPA uh, filtration system and I bring that to school and it stays at school and that's what's kept me safe because I just don't know if I'm safe. Um, and the solution again is not to open the dampers and let the cold air in. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sharon. Um, the next uh, person whose hand is raised for public comment um, is Anthony Peck. Anthony, you can unmute. Thank you, Mayor. Hello, my name is Anthony Peck and I live on 9 Laurel Street. I'm a parent of a fifth grader and an 11th grader at Jackson Street and NHS, respectively. Uh, first, thank you, school committee, for the long hours you've been putting in during the COVID-19 pandemic. I know there have been many hours here. Um, last night, I was surprised to receive an email about pausing athletics due to a clause in the MOA. I want to acknowledge the wisdom of monitoring COVID-19 case rates, not only in Northampton, but also neighboring communities. I think that's a really smart thing. At the same time, I think it's important to consider that the metric that led to the pausing of in-person services, while appropriate for indoor situations, may be less so for outdoor contexts, such as fall athletics, where risk can be further mitigated by physical dis distancing, mask wearing, and hand hygiene. While there has been an uptick in the number of COVID-19 cases per 100,000 persons in Holyoke, there has been no increase in Northampton. Indeed, the number of cases per 100,000 in Northampton has steadily decreased since the summer to its present level, present level near zero cases per 100,000 over the last three weekly reports, according to the Massachusetts Department of Health. 
The positivity rate over the last three weekly reports for Northampton have ranged from 0.03% to 0.05%. These are really small numbers. Given the continuing, continuing low rate of COVID-19 in Northampton and the low risk of transmitting COVID-19, particularly with the adoption of strategies used in athletics to mitigate these risks, I urge the members of the school community to advocate for an unpausing of athletics at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next person who has their hand raised uh, to speak in public comment is Kate Kelly. Kate, you can unmute yourself, please. Good evening and thank you to the school committee for your time and for taking our comments. Um, I am a um, public health nurse, school nurse, and spent the last seven years in pediatric primary care as a primary care provider. I'm also a mom to a second grader um, in our time when we went back in August. So I was in pandemic preparedness. So I bring a lot of hats to speak with you this evening. Um, and obviously I'm now a member of the union and, um, and happy to be so. I wanna tell you a little bit about what's happening at Leeds. Um, You're having some connectivity issues, um, Kate. We're having a hard time hearing you. You, you may wanna turn your video off. Elementary level are actually surprisingly good at wearing their masks. Certainly they do slip down at times. And as the school nurse, I have made Is that any? Yes, I think sometimes turning the video off can help with your uh, bandwidth a little bit on the signal. Are you still there, Kate? Hmm. You're unmuted. Is this any better? Uh, yes, it is. Great, sorry, I'm moving locations. I have absolutely no idea how much is actually heard. Uh, we probably lost you about, um, you were starting to describe what was happening at Leeds and then you started to cut out a little bit. So if you wanna pick up there. Okay, great. So um, at Leeds, I'm finding that children are actually quite good at keeping their masks on. Um, they're better than some adults I know. There are certainly children who every day need reminders. Um, they're the same children who probably need reminders for a lot of things. And so the teachers are doing backflips. I mean, they are doing an incredible job. They're working very hard and I know everyone is already tired. Um, I will say, however, that as a nurse, I feel very comfortable in the building um, and I do support the idea of considering how we get more children in the building. I think that as a mom, I'm seeing that my own child is not receiving all of the services that he needs because there just aren't the people to do it right now. Um, we're having the two parent juggle of trying to both work full time. I can't even imagine the equity issues that are going on with families who are single parents or working single parents. And I'm super concerned about those children. As someone who was a primary care provider for seven years, I can only imagine that my colleagues are seeing a huge increase in the rate of anxiety and depression um, and even suicidality. I don't even know if we've had enough time in this pandemic to study that yet. Um, I understand that a lot of people are super concerned about air quality. I appreciate that the previous speaker talked about the zero case rate. It's my impression that when the case rate is zero, our best protection is the masks that prevent spread from asymptomatic individuals. When the case rate is higher, certainly air turnover probably matters more. 
Um, and certainly will make many staff members feel safer. That's what I've heard over the last few weeks. But I personally feel comfortable in the buildings as they are, as long as everyone is working as hard as they can to do extra hand washing and wear their masks. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. We appreciate it. The um, next uh, person whose hand is raised, I have a first name, uh, Madeline. Uh, Madeline, if you will um, unmute yourself and uh, let us know who you are and where you live. Hi, uh, my name is Madeline Naj. I live in Hatfield and I'm coming to this meeting today um, not as a representative, but as one of the master swimmers who takes advantage of or has taken advantage of the great program at JFK, um, led by coach Kim Beerwert. Um, and I know I speak for many other master swimmers that um, we would love to see the pool be able to open, certainly with safety considerations. Um, but it is very, very missed. Um, a lot of us are still swimming outdoors and it's getting awfully cold. Um, and we're hoping that there is a way to accommodate some swimming at the JFK pool in the months to come. Um, I wanted to mention that the UMass Masters team um, has just started their program up again. They're actually using a pool at Hampshire College, not at the UMass campus. Um, and they are structuring it in a way that the, each lane is limited to, I think, two or three swimmers that start at either end of the pool. Um, so there aren't people next to each other, um, at least standing next to each other at a wall at any point. Um, and my thought for JFK, and this might work for other pool programs, not just the masters, um, but there are six lanes and maybe having um, two people per lane, so a total of 12 swimmers on a given morning. Um, and then, um, you know, so keeping the distance, maybe having some kind of checkpoint for people coming in a temperature check or something like that. Um, and in the previous uh, pre-COVID times, we had masters swims um, every Tuesday and Thursday mornings. Um, and so my thought again would be if this was considered to, to start up again, maybe on a trial basis, uh, is to have um, half the group on one day, half the group on another. Um, I'm not sure of the numbers, but I know they were pretty high when we had to shut the program down in March. Um, but my idea would accommodate at least 12 people, twice, you know, or 24 people total um, once a week. And um, that maybe that income coming in from swimmers wanting to use the pool would be helpful at a time when, you know, income in uh, many things is in short supply. And I guess basically I wanted to say um, how great the program is um, with, with Kim coaching. It's really been wonderful and um, we miss it. And, you know, I'm just putting in a plug to consider uh, finding a way to make that program happen again, as well as other pool programs. I'm sure other swimmers and exercisers are, are missing that time dearly. Thank so, you. Yep, that's all I have to say. Great, thank you so much. Um, the uh, next person who has uh, their hand raised to speak is John Galvin. John, if you'll unmute yourself. Yeah, good evening. Uh, first of all, I want to Second, the thoughts from Kate Kelly about the children at risk and completely support what she talked about. And also Anthony Paik about the pausing of athletics and the data that is really clear about why and when schools should be doing in-person learning. The, there are many teachers who are doing a great job in this remote environment. 
and some of them were here tonight. I saw Kate Parrott. Many teachers, however, are struggling. It is not a tool that they are comfortable with. It is not a tool, quite frankly, that they are good at. And let me just give you a little sense of what happened with my three children today. So uh, you see my name. I live at Prospect Court in Northampton. We have three children in the school system, two in high school and one at JFK. Uh, my daughter who's at JFK did an online history test today. And when she submitted it both times, she got an error message. And when she reported it to the teacher, the teacher replied with, weird, I hope it was easy for you. Our junior was, uh, one teacher was not holding class because Wi-Fi challenges. And the next class was not held because the teacher's doctor's appointment was running long. Meanwhile, there's a teacher service day tomorrow, and there was one yesterday. And my freshman had a 15-minute history test and had a worksheet for math, and that took five minutes and then had two and a half hours off. This is not education. This is not working. Some teachers are doing a great job. Many are not, and we need to fix that. The but it is critical that we get these kids back in school. And it's critical, as Anthony Paik mentioned, that we follow the data from Commissioner Riley's letter to the 16 school districts who he encouraged to get back in class. He said, there's clear consensus, and I'm reading from his letter, from both education and medical groups. We must keep in mind not only the risks associated with COVID-19 for in-person school programs, but also the known challenges and consequences of keeping students out of school. Indeed, the Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics endorsed this guidance in a letter to the DESE. It is time to start acting on behalf of the students in the school system get our student athletes back on the field, unpause the pause today, and revisit the agreement currently in place with the teachers union. The students deserve it. Well, that was a disaster. Thank you very much. Um, the next person who has their hand raised to speak is John Fry. John, if you'll um, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, community members. Uh, John Fry, JFK Parent, 60 North Street in Northampton. Uh, first, let me thank you all for your time and efforts on the school committee. It is surely an overwhelming commitment during these difficult times. I'm writing today to question the use of item 12.D in the MOA and the abrupt closure of in-person school for our most, most vulnerable students today. Item 12.D, determination of pausing and resuming in-person services sets the metrics for closing school based on COVID-19 numbers, not only in Northampton, but also numbers in Holyoke and East Hampton. It needs to be noted that school choice enrollment accounts for less than 8% of the student body in the Northampton schools. And these students come from 24 different towns and sending districts. East Hampton is the largest sending town, but represents just 2% of overall enrollment. Holyoke is second at under 1.5%. Given the above, it does not make any sense that NACE and the school committee chose to single out Holyoke and East Hampton metrics in trigger, triggering an automatic suspension of services. Put another way, a red designation in East Hampton and or Holyoke cannot be a trigger to shut down Northampton schools on its own. And no one community outside of Northampton accounts for more than 2% of the student body. In school terms, this would be like taking a 50 question exam acing 49 questions, but getting just one wrong and flunking, school automatically closed. If the committee wants a useful metric in determining risk, besides simply using Northampton's own numbers, you must prorate the populations and the number of students and teachers from each town. Each town would contribute to the score while recognizing that Northampton numbers should account for about 90% of that total. It's easy to build a spreadsheet that weighs these numbers, and each week you plug in the current COVID numbers from each town, this would give you a useful and proper tool in determining risk and triggering school closures. As you move forward in designing metrics for when we do go to a hybrid model, 
which we need to consider now when Northampton's numbers are nearly zero. This formula needs to be tweaked. I urge the school committee to take a more active role in writing the MOA rather than capitulating to the desires and demands of NACE, which it appears is what has been happening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next person who has their hand raised is Kim Beerwert. Kim, you can uh, go ahead and unmute. Good morning. Um, thank you for uh, taking my, my call. I just wanted to amplify what I uh, wrote to you uh, yesterday about the uh, availability of school facilities for use by the Recreation Department. Um, I've been coaching swing for a long time. I've been operating pools for a long time. I operated the Northampton Swim Club this summer. Um, I note that the YMCA is open and has a lot of its facilities open and available, including the pool. There are many fitness facilities that are also open and operating. So I think there are many models that can allow uh, the safe and, and useful operation of the pool and the other JFK athletic facilities. And I think that when we're talking about overall health of people, we do need to consider their physical wealth, physical health, and also the mental release and the mental state when someone does get exercise. Certainly there are many times when families can appreciate using a pool and there are many, many structures that can be used to allow families to use the pool as well as the programming, including swing instruction. And as Madeline indicated earlier, the master's program. And if the master's program happens, that's wonderful. If it doesn't, that's okay. But I think it's very, very critical that people have the opportunity to exercise, to have that stress relief and have that enjoyment. And operating the swim club pool, which is obviously an outdoor pool, a very different situation from an indoor environment. But over and over again, people commented how wonderful it was to have a sense of normalcy, to have a release, to allow kids to play, to have swimming instruction. All these things are very, very important in overall health. The school committee has obviously recognized the importance of athletics by allowing athletics up until this point. Um, and they understand the well-being that students get out of that. Well, that is true of the community as a whole. The community as a whole can be, can, will benefit greatly if facilities are run safely and are available for our community to use. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so um, I've been using the um, hand raise function um, in terms of calling on folks. Um, I just was noted to me that there's someone on the call who's raising their physical hand and um, may not have access to the hand raise um, function. Um, so there's a person on the call who's using M real, M R E A L. Um, and so I wanted, and I believe they've had their hand up. So I wanted to call on them next and then I'll pick up again with the hand raise function. So, um, M real, if you could un, oh, M R E S L, I believe is the actual uh, call sign. If you could unmute yourself. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Um, my name is Michael Rodriguez and I reside in, uh, in West Hampton at 87 Chesterfield Road with my partner, Erica Silva. I'm a former Nike elite athlete and an event director with 43 years experience on local, regional, national, and international events, mostly athletic events, and specifically with creating and implementing and executing logistics, which are the specifics we're all faced with amidst COVID. So my intent tonight amidst everything that's really important amidst COVID is the JFK pool reopening. There's significant and vital points from scientists, their data, and infectious disease experts. And they are as follows. One, volume of water dismisses virus droplets in water during active swimming, lap swimming, and continual pace of swimming. Two, and it's very important, this piece. It is not in water that's of concern or risk, nor the act of swimming. It's specifically all about out of water, arriving at the facility, moving around the facility, being around others. Therefore, three, it's vital to have experienced persons create, implement, execute, and adjust if needed all logistics outside of the water. Here are my observations and tips from my experience that is applicable and with focus on intel from scientists, their data, 
and infectious disease experts. Provide links in order to educate on the COVID scientific data from infectious disease experts with swimming, meaning lap swimming at continual pace. Many pool facilities in the US have opened or are in the process due only to the scientific data, scientists and infectious disease experts. And this is important to be reminded continually. Volume of water dismisses virus droplets in water during active swimming, lap swimming at continual pace. With this data and intel, USA Swim Federation, college and high school swim teams throughout the US, pending obviously the COVID data from within their area, are training and are not in sports bubbles, which means the athletes are completely quarantined with one another and are training safely, sometimes monitoring and or testing if needed, with multiple swimmers per lane with staggered pacing and spacing. USA Swim Federation facilities have eight feet wide lanes. If possible use at general pools, that would be recommended. As a former elite athlete, sports should be canceled due to the related specifics of close contact, physical contact, and clearly respirations. However, in accordance with COVID protocol from scientists, their data and infectious disease experts, elite swim teams, USA Swim Federation, college and high school swim teams, and general pool facilities can and have been opening, but vital tips and, con and concepts to work with and implement are critical. And some of those tips are masks are worn at all times except when during active swimming. Locker rooms are not necessarily being used at this stage due to COVID. We all haven't seen one another and locker rooms have a negative effect and impact by allowing congregating talking, visiting, and or hanging out. Restrooms can be available by request, keeping them locked if they're within locker rooms. Then if locker rooms are used, they're open. If not, they're locked and they're open by request only. It is vital to have proper logistics. You're, you're getting close to your three minutes. So if you could just okay. wrap up, please. Yeah, we've been okay. three minutes. All right. Um, you know, there's just a, there's some specifics I had for JFK pool about current members only, no use, hallway and locker rooms. I'll refer to that in a moment. The entry and ex exits could be the four glass doors. The shine in sheets would reveal the COVID protocol for contact testing. Uh, there could be examples of on the sign in sheet, your allotted time, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or max an hour. Example, I swim a mile in 35 minutes, so I'm out of the lane completely. Um, you know, uh, persons that are quarantined together in a lane, partner, spouses, family can share. Um, when you're entering and exit a lane, you're wearing um, a mask until that point. Once you're out of the lane, you would need to go to a curtained area. If the lockers at JFK pool are not to be used, then they Thank you so be. much. I, I, I know that you're, this is a lot yeah. of great information, yeah. but I want to make sure I give everybody else equal yeah. time to be able to I understand. Stay so thank you so much though. And we have your written comments as well that you've sent. So Thanks for your time. Members. Thank you so much. You bet. Um, so the next person who signed up, um, who's raised their hand rather, is Aaron McDonald. Aaron, if you can um, uh, unmute yourself. And again, I'm keeping a three minute timer and I'm trying to let people know when they get close to the end. Sure, thank you. Hi, my name is Aaron McDonald. I live at 155 West Hampton Road in Florence. And um, like many parents on this call tonight, I wanted to speak in response to the decision to pause in-person services at Northampton Public Schools. Like many parents, I was simply incredulous this morning when I heard the superintendent's voicemail and uh, the, the data that he shared that this decision was based upon. I Not only do I urge the JMLC to reverse this pause, but I would love to see NACE and the school committee work together to amend or strike this article in a way that, that makes sense and it has some significance uh, in terms of statistics as this clearly does not. From a logistical perspective, I can't imagine what it is going to be like for parents who have children 
with uh, receiving in-person services to have to wait for a map to be released each week to determine uh, where, where their schedule goes, what's going to happen uh, with their kids' services. Um, that to me just seems like a completely unrealistic plan and not at all an efficient way to go about it. Nothing that works for kids or families. And in terms of children also not being able to engage in athletics, uh, I know I can speak for my household when I say in this remote model, that is one of the only bright spots for my kids. The fact that they are sitting all day, it's not good for their minds, their bodies, and to have that outlet for them is something that's been simply invaluable. And for that to, come away now based on a metric that just makes no sense, makes it just that much harder for all of us as parents to, to stay positive for our kids and to keep them going in this model that's just not working. So I really would urge the school committee and NACE to work together and to take another look at this. Unfortunately, a remote model, an in-person model, a hybrid model, is not going to thrive on a foundation that's crumbling. And I really fear that's what's happening. I've really been disheartened to see what's happening within our education community in terms of lack of communication, lack of clarity, lack of transparency uh, as all these decisions have been made. So I really urge you to work together. I know it's hard work and I appreciate all the hard work that you've done but I also know that it's possible and I really feel that we owe it to our kids and I hope this is something that you'll consider. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was right at three minutes. Well done. Thank you. Um, the next uh, person who has their hand raised is Andrea Bertini. Andrea, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi, uh, my name is Andrea Bertini. I live at Liberty. I live on Liberty Street in Florence. I have two kids at, in elementary school at JSS. Uh, first, I want to say that our teachers are working extremely hard and should be commended for the work they are doing. Um, both of our son's teachers have been doing tremendous things, but we also recognize they have be, been given an absolutely impossible task. Today, when we were notified that because cases were rising in Holyoke, that special education services in person were being shut down, and that in 48 hours they would determine the next course of action. The thing that, that stuck out was if that cases in communities other than ours are determining whether or not we can have in-person services, then why didn't we start in a hybrid model when communities around us had done that? There was also no plan for delivery of special education services when we decide to shut down because of other communities. So more learning time for not just my child, but other children is being lost. We have a professional development day tomorrow, an entire week of unchanged half days, and at a late start to the school year. We also have an asynchronous uh, uh, day on Wednesdays, even though we are in a remote plan that seems to have no potential and, and, no, and to turn to a hybrid plan at any point this academic year. Our numbers for COVID will not get any lower than they've been this fall. Everything in remote learning takes longer and there has been no change to all the professional development days, half days, et cetera, to make up for this loss. Assessments on learning loss are finally underway. The planning and execution has been chaotic and disorganized and it will be weeks before things like Title I services for first and second grade will be determined and what help students will need to recover. And so many more children are going to need support. The schools, particularly JSS, do not have the resources or staff to accomplish that. The teachers for our children should be commended for their hard work and effort, but for K through five, remote learning is an absolute, is absolutely a disaster. Between the constant technical glitches, the help students need to get, navigate the online world, and the lack of engagement by so many students, every effort should have been made and needs to be made to get our elementary students back into in-person school. It is discouraging, extremely stressful, and disheartening to families like ours in this community. If we are staying remote, which many of us feel is the intention, there needs to be more teaching, the days get shorter every week, the instructions time is already shrinking as class management and just navigating the technological issues, how to get things for students with no help at home gets worse, not better each day. This also includes the time they spend in their specials. There should also be every effort made to get elementary school on the same schedule. 
for our two kids that have different lunch times and different breaks. So our kids are even more isolated than they were in the spring as they sit silently and alone, eating their lunch or snacks while their sibling is in, in their class. When and where is all the social and emotional well-being and academic development being made up? Why wasn't any of this even considered when determining the schedule? Literally everything is open, restaurants, stores, indoor recreational spaces, high schools and youth sports as they keep talking about the sports and how important they are. We're leaving our elementary school students at home and isolated. When NACE and the school committee negotiated, it very much seems that the people left out of any consideration, care or concern was the children and taxpaying families in this community. And that in itself is disgraceful. Thank you. That was, that was time. So thank you so much for your comments. Um, the next person who has their hand up to speak is Melissa Madison. Melissa, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I am a parent of two children. I live on Winterberry. One child goes to JFK and one child goes to Northampton High School. I am speaking to you as a pharmacist, a professor, and a parent. I think we need to think creatively and innovatively, and I'm looking for that to happen. I think parents would be behind that 100%. The World Health Organization has said that we are not returning to normal anytime soon. So if we wait for there to be zero cases, we are gonna wait beyond our lifetime, beyond our children's lifetime, beyond their time in high school or middle school. The time to bring them back has passed by months, by months. I have a typical learner and atypical learner. When my atypical learner woke up this morning, he was not going to school. He was not empowered. He was not able to do anything by himself. And so the entire day was shot. This has been going on and on. So just when we began a schedule, it has all fallen apart in a matter of hours, hours. I beg you to work together and put our children first if people want to go remote, then remote should also be an option. Other schools are doing this, Hatfield, Shrewsbury, smaller schools, bigger schools, they are doing it. We can do it. I think that we need to come together, put differences aside. We opened our university and we're still there. Next week's the seventh week we're there. I think that you can do it. And I empower you and I implore you to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next person who has their hand raised to speak um, is Liz. Liz, if you can unmute yourself and give us your name and where you live. Certainly, thank you. Um, I'm Liz Zuckerman. I live at 295 Locust Street in Florence. I'm gonna leave my video off just to make sure connectivity and also otherwise my children are gonna be waving at you Hi. all. Stop, please. Hi. Uh, I just want to briefly address the issue of the pausing of schools and how that was handled. I agree with others about the issue of but we need to have sensible metrics for when to pause and I'm having difficulty understanding why it was written into contract, pardon me, why it was written into contract that it would be dependent upon the status in Holyoke. Um, but leaving that aside for a moment because I think other speakers have addressed that, I have a four-year-old just four year old on an IEP who started preschool about two weeks ago. This is his fourth preschool this calendar year due to COVID. Um, I had enrolled him in a private preschool at the instruction of the district because it wasn't clear if there would be preschool. I switched him to what has been an absolutely wonderful program at Leeds. I have no complaints about it. However, I was never informed that it was going to suspend based upon the COVID rates in another community. Um, and I would not likely have moved him a fourth time this year had I had the knowledge that that was the case, because I think it was foreseeable that Holyoke, given its density and other factors, was likely to go into the red zone. Um, so I think that the district needs to account for the fact that it did not provide parents with this information before, that, before they made decisions that are affecting the education of vulnerable children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next person who has their hand raised to speak is Mark Esposito. Mark, if you can unmute yourself, please. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Esposito. I live at 203 State Street. I have uh, three kids, two of whom are at Jackson Street. Uh, the youngest hasn't started school yet. Um, I have a letter uh, that was actually written by uh, my wife, Rachel Curry Rubin, to the school committee um, that I would like to read um, at least the first part of. Um, this letter may be more about the overarching challenges um, we see rather than a specific call to be either in-person or hybrid. Um, I want to illustrate these challenges because I feel that they need to be addressed whether we are in the same physical space or meeting remotely. I am both a parent of three young children and a professional who works with children who attend schools in many districts in Western Massachusetts and beyond. I've had the opportunity to assess hundreds of children since March, many of them in person and some over Zoom. I've assessed children from at least 35 districts, if not more, since the pandemic began. Overall, it has been exhilarating to see the effort put in to address the needs of some students, and it has been heartbreaking to see the academic, social, and emotional skill decline of other students. The challenges that I write about today are unfortunately not unique to the time of COVID. There are issues that are talked about extensively here in Northampton and elsewhere. Uh, they exist in academic literature and simply in the milieu. I moved back to Northampton and put my children in public schools because I feel that Northampton has possibilities and opportunities because of the educators, parents, and community members in this district. I've seen educators go above and beyond for children. However, like in all districts, I've also seen children whose needs are not being met. I want to provide an example of two children with many similarities and also many differences. One of the children is my own child. She is not the best reader or best math mathematician in her class and certainly not in her grade but she has a love of learning and I taught her how to read using research-based methods so she is accurate, fluent, and has good comprehension. She has a brain for mathematics that I do not. She is also at times disorganized and impatient. The second child is a child that I met through my work. Like my daughter, she can be disorganized and impatient at times. Like my daughter, she loves her friends and likes the social aspects of school. However, unlike my daughter, she reads significantly below grade level. While my daughter reads to her younger sisters, this child's younger sibling reads to her. This child's mother is similar to me. We are both deeply invested and engaged in our children's learning. However, unlike me, she cannot navigate her daughter's Google Classroom, and she must rely on her younger child to help them both. The most important similarity between my daughter and this child is that the work they are asked to engage with is not geared towards them or anywhere close to them. My child had a meeting with her teacher recently that she initiated. Though I was not at the meeting, my daughter relayed to me that she had asked for harder and more math work. She has also asked in writing for more critical feedback because, as she says, I want to be a better writer this year. There has been no differentiation as of yet, though her teacher provides support and really listens to her ideas. I don't blame her. The teacher is on Zoom from 8.50 to 2.50 daily. Doing more, one more thing for one more kid is a ridiculous ask. It does, however, indicate a lack of support in being able to plan for all learners. Differentiation is not my favorite word in education because it often means more work for teachers. I believe a better concept and perhaps a better practice is universal design for learning, where differences in learners are planned for from the outset. Though UDL can be more work up front, it is often less work down the line for teachers. I wonder if UDL would be a helpful concept and framework to work toward in this district. Would it cut down? That's time, Mark. So if you could just finish this sentence or finish it up. So that... Yes, thank you. Um, is the entire letter in the record? What's that? Is the entire letter in the record already? Yes, it was. It was yep. sent to the school committee just prior to the meeting. Okay. It, yes, it, so if, it's, if it's permissible, Rachel also has her hand raised and, and, and could read the, the rest of the letter in public comment. Thank you. Okay. Um, is Rachel there with you? Uh, she's on another screen. Okay. Um, well, uh, why don't I call on Rachel just since you're mid letter here and I'll, I'll recognize Rachel. Um, I don't see your hand raised, but um, Um, so I wonder if universal design for learning would be a helpful concept and framework to work towards in this district. Would it cut down on the amount of work over time for our overworked underpaid teachers? In any case, the lack of differentiation or UDL in my daughter's class as of today is in no way the teacher's fault. She has a large class, there are children with significant needs, and it's certainly not the most important thing in the world that my daughter gets math geared to her level. 
It is, however, a huge turnoff for her to be in class and the content is not pushing her to learn new things. At least for now, however, we are making the effort to support NPS and her teachers by asking her to be present and engaged and to be supportive of her teacher and of other students. The other child, I am told by her mother, cannot access her math book enough to read the directions. Her teacher moves on before she's even finished one problem. During reading, she listens to a story but is unable to do any independent work. Like my daughter, she encounters work that is not appropriate for her needs. Again, this is not surprising, nor, does it, nor is it her teacher's fault. I suspect that her teacher stays up at night thinking about her and considering ways to better support her. Last spring, I advocated strongly to our school that they do assessment in the first weeks of school or to consider creative solutions to assess students in the summertime. I know that this kind of creativity is possible because I've been part of large scale assessment efforts and have assessed with significant support hundreds of children in much larger districts in Northampton. There are lots of challenges, particularly during COVID, but Northampton is a creative place. What an earlier assessment would have done is ensure that children are present with work that or presented with work that they can do and that they will benefit from. We talk a lot in Northampton about children's social and emotional growth. Part of social emotional growth is feeling efficacious. Children who encounter work that is significantly above their skill level and told that they should be able to do it feel helpless. They become hopeless and they become depressed. They feel stupid and inadequate. They feel that their friends are smarter than they are. Children who are not challenged feel bored and turned off by school. They feel their teachers do not know them. This time period is already a depressing time. There are ways, however, to protect children against feeling hopeless and depressed. As teachers know, one of those ways is to engage them, to stretch their thinking in just the right ways, to teach them at their level, and to provide material they can access in ways that they want to access it. I understand that doing assessment at this time is challenging, and I understand that knowing where children are is challenging. However, one of the things that I've heard repeatedly at our school level and at the district level is that teachers are experts at their trade, and they are experts at differentiation. I think we should be honest in Northampton and say out loud that differentiation is not occurring during this time, at least not everywhere. I also have a first grader who's done with her classwork other than specials by 10 a.m. on most days. Like her sister, she is not an unusually advanced reader or mathematician, but she is not being challenged. She's doing exactly the same work as that of her peers. There have been no extension activities. Um, there has also been no project-based learning in Northampton since we've been home. I bring that up because projects can be a good way to universally design a classroom to ensure that all students are working towards the same goal. I've heard teachers in Northampton say that differentiation, deep learning, and interesting projects are important, but I'm not seeing it during this time, despite seeing it really extensively in some other districts. Overall, it's important to acknowledge what's not happening and why it's not happening. Maybe it's not happening because it's difficult. It's difficult to understand exactly where all children are at this time. Maybe it's not happening because kids have yet to be assessed, though assessment is coming. So, just in, in ending this, I just want to say that I understand that teachers are working hard. I do not fault them, but I implore Northampton administrators to be more proactive and pull the resources together to support teachers and families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to you and Mark for your comments this evening. Um, the next person who has their hand raised is uh, Patrick Bogan. Patrick, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. You hear me okay? Okay. Good evening, everyone, members of the school committee, Dr. Proverse, Mayor Narkowitz. Um, I just wanted to ask a few questions. I realize I won't get them answered at this time during public comment, but um, they may be more directed at uh, Dr. Proverse, and I thought it might be useful for consideration of the school committee as a whole. Wanted to know um, what happens if the demand for in-person services, um, including under the remote model, exceeds what is currently permissible in terms of amount of students who can be in our school buildings and staff. Um, and to the extent possibly as part of answering that question or looking forward to a possible hybrid or full in-person, what use of tents or other large spaces in our buildings is being considered for um, increasing either airflow or distance between students. Uh, think of like cafeterias, auditoriums, gymnasiums um, as part of bringing students back under uh, whatever uh, ventilation and other safety rules are in place. Um, if the district, uh, per discussed at like the August Miller Camp, remote, hybrid, or in person, I was curious if, if the uh, school committee ought to, is interested in going to a full hybrid model 
one person is looking at a phased in return as we've seen in other districts, perhaps starting with K through two. Um, I suggest K through two since the youngest kids are considered less vectors for COVID. And I think that they're also zooming the worst of the students in the district just because they don't have the skills or attention span at the age uh, more so than older kids to access the material. Um, most notably, they, a lot of them can't read at this point, which makes it particularly challenging. I'm also curious what the budget is going to look like for the district, given that the additional costs it's facing and potentially loss of students who are opting out of the remote model. Um, going back to what's been talked about earlier tonight, is it necessary to shut down schools in person on such short notice, given that there, have, there are several other safety measures in place, mass, ventilation, et cetera? And lastly, what can the community do to help during this time? Um, I know there's a lot of logistical challenges that the district is facing. I think a lot of us would be interested in providing help, whatever that can be, if it's being on committees or helping write grants or helping put up tents or other measures that many of us would be interested in doing that. So I think that's all that I had for now. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, the next uh, person whose uh, hand is raised to speak in public comment is Seth Cable. Seth, you can um, unmute yourself. All right. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Seth Cable. I live at 73 Barrett Street with my wife, Summer, and our three kids. One goes to JSS and the other two go to JFK. I'm also faculty at UMass, where cases have been uh, rising quite dramatically in just the last week, if you've seen that. Um, so I just wanted to see a few words in favor of uh, keeping with the remote model rather than moving to the hybrid model uh, that's been discussed, um, at least until a vaccine is widely available. So while the current remote learning model arrangements are not ideal, they seem to me and many others far preferable to the hybrid learning plan, at least the one that's currently being discussed. So the hybrid learning model that's currently being proposed has only two days of face-to-face -face instruction in highly restrictive environments where children have extremely limited ability to move uh, from their desk or from their rooms. And we found the current remote learning arrangement allows for, well, it allows for four days of face-to-face -face instruction and also allows students to move from room to room or even take short walks sometimes during their breaks. And um, I and others do find that this works adequately enough for our students, though of course it does not at all compare to a normal traditional day in school. But, you know, if our only options are between the current remote teaching model and this hybrid model that's been proposed, for myself and many others, there really just doesn't seem to be any advantage to bringing the kids back into the school and a lot of potential disadvantage in the risk that it poses to raising our local rates of COVID. Um, and to kind of adapt RBG's well-known umbrella analogy, we don't want to be throwing away our umbrella when there's still a rainstorm surging all around us, particularly if doing so doesn't really pose any educational advantage. And so I would urge the school committee to continue keeping uh, the vast majority of kids out of the schools until a vaccine is widely available. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, the next person who is signed up to speak in public comment is Stephen Moga. Stephen, you can unmute yourself, please. Hello, thank you, school committee members, Mayor Narkowitz. Um, I wanna just start by saying that Holyoke Public Schools are open today for children with IEPs, um, children that have disabilities. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. But as we talk about other communities and we think about equity in our region and equity in the school district, we should think about how we use numbers or metrics to make our decisions. I'm very reluctant to talk personally about my family, but I'm gonna do that tonight because I feel like the school committee members need to hear. We worked for weeks with the special education team at Bridge Street School. I should say, I live at 89 Marion Street. I'm a Northampton resident and a Northampton voter. We worked for weeks with the special education team um, of many different specialists at um, try, trying to arrange a meeting for our fourth grader 
with the behavioral specialist, which was supposed to take place today, outdoors, not in the school, but outdoors. And that meeting was canceled today. And it's heartbreaking because our son, um, he had a great relationship with the BCBA there. And we know that those services would make a difference in his schooling. And we talk about these children in a whole variety of ways. I think that there is one decision about fully remote and there's a whole other decision or consideration about canceling in-person services for what the MOA refers to as high risk children, right? And this to me is sort of 1980s at risk youth kind of language. These are kids who need supports to be able to participate in learning, right? And they have a lot of different reasons why they need to do that. To cancel those services for those children in those buildings is a very different kind of decision. And to do it on a metric that comes from another school district that remains open, where those kids are still getting those services, to me, is shocking. So I would hope that in the coming weeks, the school district can reevaluate this decision. I personally feel like we could rip up this MOA and start over because what we have right now is not working. It's not working for so many kids, for so many families, and the metrics that we have established seem arbitrary, and they're, um, they're not working for us. So we need something better. We should do more outdoor education. We should follow all the public health guidance. We should take into careful consideration the best medical opinions and the advice of organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the next person who has their hand raised is Marissa Hochstetter. Marissa, you can unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking the members of the school committee who have dialogued and responded to me. Um, some of you have been really, I think, gracious at a time when you're probably getting a lot coming at you. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much depth right now because I've talked with many of you. Um, I just want to say publicly that I support a move to um, hybrid or even in-person learning. Um, I would really strongly urge you to consider separating elementary from the upper grades if you are unable to um, address all of this. We Remote learning is not working for an ele uh, elementary school students. I, sorry, I live at Washington Avenue and I have two fourth graders. The lack of transparency in the negotiation of the agreement and the lack of inclusion of family voices with the outsized influence of NACE is hurting us. Um, no matter what model you choose, we really do need to acknowledge that remote learning is not working. We got a schedule four days before school started and it appeared that our children would be engaged from 8.50 to three o'clock and that we, my husband and I would both somehow be able to work. Um, in fact, it's really a ruse. I would say there is probably 30 minutes of active um, teaching time with no differentiation. So our teacher is clearly working incredibly hard I see comments in Google Docs from her at 1 a.m. Uh, she has 24 students. And for my learners, there is zero differentiation, no engagement, no breakout rooms, no opportunity to engage with their friends. And so really no one is getting what they need. Um, thing that I would say maybe don't need to have such an outsized place on the schedule like library is someone pressing play on an audio book for them and the students walk away. Um, they see their friends on screen all day, but they really don't have any opportunity to engage with them. And so I wanted to give you a couple um, examples and urge you to consider moving us out of a remote model. Um, keep that as an option for people who need it, but find a way to offer students some uh, in-person time, albeit less kids in a room, more restrictive. They need to see their friends and they need to move. Um, I think it's interesting to hear all the comments about opening the pool and I listened to the school committee where you um, meeting where you voted to approve varsity sports. So obviously there is a way to move to have physical education for um, students. 
events. There's a lot of outdoor space. It feels like we've sort of lost a window now. Um, but remote learning is not working for elementary school students and whatever you think is happening um, from my experience and what I'm seeing, it is not happening. It does not and should not count as teaching and learning time. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. The next person who has their hand raised is Michael Bishop. Michael, you can, um, you can unmute yourself, please, and let us know where you live. Sure. Uh, my name is Michael Bishop. I live on Western Avenue in Northampton, and I have a daughter in the fourth grade at Jackson Street. Um, in March, when the pandemic started, in the absence of very much information about the virus, I was terrified to go to the grocery store. Every moment I spend inside, I spend in fear. Fast forward to today, I'm pretty comfortable in the store because I have a mask on, as does everyone around me. Um, and the store even removed the restriction of wearing gloves because the science didn't support their efficacy. Mm. The news that I read tells me about parts of the country where there is an uptick, but those areas don't seem to have the same mask habits that I see in the grocery store around me. Our community model is not their model. Um, and I recently read an article uh, and was inspired by this in the New York Times this past July about Mary Packard and Ellen Stone, two Rhode Island doctors who, in the midst of widespread tuberculosis in the early 20th century, proposed an experiment for open air classrooms. They found empty buildings with large windows. They kept them open. They taught school inside. None of the students got sick. And within two years, there were 65 open air schools around the country. And that article goes on to describe many, many creative ideas. And this all happened like in the winter. It was, it was cool, but they found ways. They first started with the students, how they were gonna keep the students in school. And then they moved backward and figured out how they were gonna do that with safety. Um, I have appreciated all the extra work done by our teachers as they navigate the Zoom software and then come up with novel ways of holding class virtually. But I've also been frustrated that our community hasn't been able to come up with a similarly creative solution like they did 100 years ago. In response to reading this article in the Times, I asked my own child, if you went to school in person, but all the windows were open, there was a fan going, you had to wear a mask all day long, and everyone had to wear a coat since it was cold, would you rather do that or would you rather do school at home over the computer? And without hesitation, she said, I'd rather wear my coat. The point isn't that outdoor school isn't the perfect school, it's that my child is willing to compromise to have a different form of schooling. No solution is gonna be perfect at this moment because there's no solution that's without risk, but I believe we should be able to put our heads together and come up with something more balanced. We could consider reduced hours, outdoor schooling, open window classrooms, on and on. And we're a small community with many potential volunteers to erect tents, build picnic tables, and assemble kerosene heaters. How can the Northampton Public School District be a leader and show the rest of the country how to continue in the face of a pandemic? And I would love to see the New York Times write an article about us. Um, because I was curious, I did a cursory search to see how other countries have opened their schools. In every article I found, there was an accompanying photo showing a classroom with every child wearing a mask. If our kids were offered a choice of either remote school or you wear a mask all the time over your nose and mouth, I'm confident they would choose the mask like my daughter chose her coat. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. The um, next person who has their hand raised is Emmett Anderson. Emmett, if you can uh, unmute yourself and just let us know uh, where you live. Hi, uh, my name is Emmett Anderson. I live at 73 Vernon Street in Northampton and I am a senior at the high school. Um, and I apologize, I didn't like prepare anything, so this is kind of just going to be off the dome. But uh, I wanted to bring up uh, an issue that definitely does not affect the majority of the Northampton Public Schools com uh, community, but is affecting me greatly, which is that I am currently applying to college uh, in the midst of a global pandemic. And I have had one meeting with my guidance counselor in person and one meeting virtually. Um, and I have not met with her since February in person. And at our previous meeting, she said, wow, your interests have changed a lot since February. Um, she also said in my meeting that I am, you know, very much on top of the situation, which I don't necessarily feel, which means that a lot of my peers are very much not on top of this situation in terms of applying to college. Um, I have friends that are planning on applying in, you know, 24 days and still aren't sure where. Um, and it just feels like the school isn't you know, that involved as they normally are. Um, it's kind of key for us to be able to, you know, pop into guidance and be like, 
Hey, Miss Sullivan, I have this question. Can you answer it for me right now? I can't wait for an email that you'll get back to the next day. Um, so I would just really urge if there's any way that we could, you know, have some sort of college counseling sessions for seniors and then the rising junior class, for however long this continues, hopefully that won't be a problem, but just some sort of face to face, like this is what I'm doing next year and I need your help on how to do it. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, the next person who has their hand raised for public comment is Lauren Duffy. Lauren, if you can uh, unmute yourself and just introduce yourself and where you live. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Lauren Duffy and I live on Beaver Brook Loop in Leeds with my wife and my two young children. One of my children has autism spectrum disorder and he attends Leeds Elementary. My son exhibits only mild symptoms in a typical school environment and his IEP was written in that vein. Uh, based on those experiences. However, the sensory processing difficulties that come along with autism are interacting in a very negative way with remote learning via Zoom due to the chaotic visual and audio stimuli, challenging internet connectivity, different volumes of speakers, 17 different Zoom backgrounds. He is dysregulated within an hour or two each day and his ability to participate in instruction is deeply impacted. I would now like to read to you from page 44 of the remote learning plan for Northampton Public Schools, which speaks to the services planned for special populations, including my son. The district has begun contacting families regarding their child's needs for the fall and will have staff programming according to those needs. Effective and timely consultation with families is a priority for the final weeks leading up to our opening on September 16th. And later in that paragraph, it says, each family will have the opportunity to collaborate with NPS to make a plan that works for their child. With no intent to disrespect the hard work of the teachers and administrators, I need you as the school committee to know that for whatever reason, this plan is not being followed. Even with the best intentions, if you don't have the resources available, you can't keep this promise. There was no communication about planning for how my son's needs would be met prior to school beginning on September 16th. Now over three weeks into instruction, we are still waiting for an IEP meeting to discuss how the stimuli of Zoom is making it harder for my son to manage the challenges of his autism. I can only assume that there are other parents of kids with mild to moderate autism whose current IEPs are not designed to meet this challenge, and I want to advocate that these IEPs, all of them, need to be proactively reviewed now, regardless of which instructional method is in place for right now or for the rest of the school year. I would also like to amplify the request that elementary school be addressed separately, as I do believe that the capacities and attention spans in this age group are significantly different and warrant different considerations. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Um, the next person who has their hand raised for public comment uh, is Tamara. Tamara, if you can unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and let us know where, you're, where you live. Yeah. Um Hi, I'm not actually uh, Tamara. It's my mom. Um, I'm Jimmy Galvin. I live at uh, One Prospect Court. Um, <clears throat> probably guess what I'm going to talk about, um, but I want to talk about uh, remote learning and the decision to take away athletics um, for an unde uh, undecided amount of time. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious remote learning isn't really working for anyone. Um, it's not working for me. No one I've talked to has said it's uh, working now well. Um, you know, I'm doing all right with it. I think people are doing their best. I know the teachers are. I don't really blame them for any of this. Um, but it's this is not a scenario that's going to uh, work for anyone. It's certainly, um, I. <laughs> this is sort of anecdotal, but I feel dumber than I was before this. Um, and, you know, that's not how I want to feel, you know, a year away from college. I know uh, Emmett was talking about he has college applications coming up. And I think to, to be going through a thing like this in such a critical uh, period in my life, in my education, certainly, I think, uh, especially when it's not necessary, is, is frustrating. And I would hope the school committee... Um, whoever's in charge of this, the, the uh, NASE would consider um, a remote learning plan or not a remote learning plan, sorry, um, a hybrid or full in person because it's, 
I think it's taking a toll on everybody. And for something that's going to have such a big impact on me basically for the rest of my life, I think it, it should be taken more into consideration. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I also want to talk about athletics. Um, that's another thing that's a big part of my life. Um, I play soccer for the varsity team at NHS. Uh, and as I'm sure you all know, our season got postponed. Uh, can't, I don't know what the right word is, but put on pause um, because of Holyoke's case, right? Which again, it's a little nonsensical to me um, when Holyoke is still playing. And I know Holyoke is also still in school. So it's, you know, these games are practices. They're a time to see our friends. Um, and it's a great outlet for everyone. I know a lot of my teammates and me kind of, that's the part of the day we look forward to. And it's a time to see, um, see our friends and do something we all love. So I think to take that away over, uh, you know, over Holyoke's case rate when Holyoke doesn't even consider it a problem at this point. I think is is unnecessary and it's doing us a disservice. Um, so I would ask school committee to please uh, reconsider doing that and please uh, consider looking into an in per uh, in person learning in some way. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. That was right on three minutes. Well done. Um, the uh, next person who has their hand raised is uh, Kate Parrott. Kate, you can unmute yourself, please. Hi, thank you, Mayor Narkowitz. My name is Kate Parrott. I am a school choice parent in two Northampton public schools. I reside in Chesterfield, Massachusetts, and I am a teacher at JFK Middle School. Um, so I initially was just wanting to speak today regarding athletics. Um, I do think that I would like to encourage the school committee to separate in the MOA the decision to stop outdoor athletics. I've seen the kids practicing, they've got their masks on. It is essential at this time that they are outside and active. Speaking of outside, I would love to be teaching your children outdoors and I would love for my child to be outdoors. And so I urge the school committee and admin to consider a more creative approach to our school year. Um, lots of people um, have talked about outdoor classrooms. I know that we looked into tents. I know that the administration looked into tents. There are no tents. Um, my nephew is teaching at Deerfield Academy and obviously money can buy you a lot. Um, but I do think that we have an amazing community full of potential partners and we can get our students having real life experiences um, that can complement a remote plan. Uh, I do have grave concerns about a hybrid plan based on um, metrics, not necessarily Holyoke, but uh, the rising numbers in our state, the outbreak at UMass. Um, but then just the fact that we're underfunded. Um, I am working really hard and I am devastated about this school year. Um, I have children in the fourth week of school who I haven't even seen their face yet because they Zoom with their camera off. That's a bizarre experience for a teacher who bases their career on relations with their kids. And so um, I urge everyone to try to work collaboratively. I really think that community partnerships, taking like JFK's day of service and creating a huge opportunity for kids to have community service learning opportunities would be a way for us to remain remote, but then also give children an opportunity to feel like they are doing something productive and also being with one another. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, I appreciate everyone's time. And this is an impossible situation during um, an unprecedented time. We hear that all day, but um, I do appreciate all of your hard work. So thank you for this time, Mayor, and um, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Um, the next person who has their hand raised is uh, Catherine Ames. Catherine, if you'll unmute yourself, please, and let us know where you live. Hi there, um, my name is Katherine Ames. I live at 207 Crescent Street. I have uh, a freshman at NHS 
and I have a seventh grader at J uh, JFK. And um, thank you, Ms. Parrott, because she's wonderful. Um, and I truly appreciate what you just said. She's one of my son's teachers. Um, I'd like to address the issue of communication and lack of transparency within the school committee and the, the union, NACE. Um, I would guess that I'm not the only parent who was sent out last night at 11 p.m. that activities were suspended based on COVID numbers in Holyoke. Um, and as many people have mentioned, Holyoke was actually in school today. Um, we were not. And for tonight, I am just going to focus on the pause that was put in place based on Holyoke's numbers. Um, I ask that you reverse the pause. We elected you school committee members to represent um, the students and caregivers in Northampton. And it feels more like you're representing the union at the expense of our kids. And it's very upsetting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next person who has their hand up in public comment is um, Margaret Ann Roncardi, uh, Roncararti, and I can't see the rest. It's Azaro, right. Margaret Ann Azaro. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Thank you. I, I'd like to just say I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak just for a couple of minutes here. Uh, I'd like to thank the school committee. Uh, they've been very receptive to many. Uh, I've reached out to them many times. I'd like to thank the teachers. I know they're trying their best and the superintendent. Um, I'm here tonight in agreement with uh, uh, many other families here in favor of a hybrid or a return to school model. I won't belabor the point. I must say I agree with just about everything. The Galvins, I agree with that, what they said, Aaron McDonald, uh, Catherine Ames. So I'm not gonna belabor the points that they've already brought up. Uh, we do live at 161 Cardinal Way in Florence. I have two children. Anthony is a senior at the high school. Ava is a freshman at the high school. Uh, I'm also a nurse. I've been a nurse for 25 years. Um, now uh, a nursing director, I have been intimately involved with COVID-19, strategic planning, policy and protocol development, and implementation of such in this very community. I have experienced firsthand how effective proper infection control measures, masking, social distancing, and hand washing can be in preventing COVID-19. Our rate in Northampton has dramatically increased, decreased, pardon dramatically decreased. I see it every single day. I've been in on this since March when this first hit Northampton and hit us hard. My biggest concern here that I want to share tonight is that decisions are not being made based on evidence-based science. They're not being made on current medical recommendations. They're not being made on prevalence and incidence rates because if they were we'd be making different decisions and our kids would be back in school. And I won't bring up the, the point that Catherine just brought up about the eight cases in 100,000 in, in the town of Holyoke, which bears no bearing at all in Northampton. How and why we were suspended today is, is, is beyond my comprehension. Again, it's against, it, it has no scientific relevance. Again, our rates in Northampton are low. We're very fortunate to live in an area where members of our community are well-educated. They're well-informed. They know what it takes to prevent COVID-19 and they're doing it. And we're seeing the results of that. Our rates are low. We need to get our kids back to school. I have not seen one plan, not one plan to get these kids back to school. We need strategic planning. We need mitigation factors in place. We need to do it safely, but there are ways to do it. But we, start, we have to start having this conversation. The time is well past. Uh, I appreciate your time uh, and listening. Uh, bottom line is I do believe we need to go back to some form of in-person in education. My kids are suffering at the expense. I just sent an email while I was on, while I'm actually listening to this committee meeting because my, my son can't get his work tonight. Three times he tried to have, have his, his work sent to him via email and it won't go through. So um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, the, next, uh, the next person whose uh, hand is raised for public comment is Andrea Agito. Andrea, if you could uh, unmute yourself. Good evening. My name is Andrea Agito, and I am the president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. I also teach kindergarten at Ryan Road Elementary School. And I would just like to, to clarify a few points this evening. Um, the decision to pause in-person learning based on surrounding districts was a collaborative decision between the school committee, district leadership, and school employees. 
It has to do with the fact that many of our students and staff come from surrounding towns. So it wasn't specifically about one town, but it was a, um, consisted of many towns in our vicinity based on where our students and staff come from. And therefore high risk in other surrounding towns can be high risk coming into our building. Our building ventilation is not ready to safely house our students yet. Our district is working really hard to fix that and get it up and running. Um, but we're still waiting for air filtration units and adequate ventilation to safely keep our students and staff. With that being said, outdoor sports were not included in that pause that's in the agreement. In the agreement, it stated only that in-person learning would pause if certain communities went into high risk um, status. And so um, outdoor sports is not something that's included in that in the district's agreement. So I just wanted to clarify that for the families that are um, concerned about that. Um, the agreement states that in-person learning would, would pause. That means in-building learning. Outdoor activities was not included in that. Um, it is critical for the public to know that the school committee and the dis district leadership and school employees want what is best for our students and keeping everyone safe in this situation is basically a three-legged stool. One leg of the stool is appropriate ventilation in our buildings. And because our buildings are older, that is something the district's working really hard on. And, but it, it does take time and it takes money. And so that is one component of that. The second leg of the school stool is social distancing and proper PPE, which I think that as many parents discuss, our students are working on and, and doing well with. Um, and I think that's something that really is attainable. The third leg is monitoring local positive cases. And that is really a critical um, component to that as well. There is no capitulating when it comes to making a plan to keep our students and staff safe. And there is just caring, well-meaning professionals trying to do what's best for our students and our community. We are not perfect, but we love our students and what we're doing, and we're doing the best that we can. Please consider the possibility that our low rates in Northampton are due to the care and caution that is being used when planning for our reopening. I look forward to continue the work with our school committee, our district leaders, and families. And as Kate said, and many of the parents on this call, to find creative ways to keep our district safe, to find ways that we can have creative solutions like outdoor learning, like projects, and community activities. This is not an us versus them. The school employees in Northampton want what's best for our students, and we're working really hard to make that happen. And I hope that this can continue to be a collaborative process. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and I believe uh, that is the last um, hand that I had for public comment. Um, this evening. So um, thank you to everyone who has spoken um, in public comment this evening. And um, as always, you can also send us your comments in writing as well. Um, so we'll now move on to the next item on our agenda, um, which is announcements. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Any, um, uh, Member Levy, you have your hand raised. Thanks. I, uh, I'm not sure if this announcement is 100% necessary, but I just want to make sure, given how many people are on the call, that the community knows that we have a special meeting scheduled for October 15th, where we will be discussing, uh, we will be hearing from our committee who we've asked to provide us with metrics to guide our decision in um, whether we vote to, to switch from our remote learning plan to either a hybrid or all in person. So I want to make sure people under people know that that meeting is scheduled for next week. Thank you, Member Levy. That's, uh, and again, that's next Thursday, um, October 15th. Um, the next person who has their hand up is Member Serafi Cox. Member Serafi Cox. Yes, um, I want to uh, announce and also give kudos to um, uh, 
both the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association as well as uh, uh, school committee member uh, Ronnie Gold for the amazing work to install a sign in front of Bridge Street School. Bridge Street School has been there. It was established in, what was it, 1743? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the current building has been there uh, since uh, the 1913, 1911, something like that. Uh, and has been added on to and added on to and has not had a sign. Nobody knew what it was if they were just passing by, but now they will. Uh, it also is going to be accompanied by a community board and uh, um, uh, Ronnie, uh, can, excuse me, member Gold can probably say more about that, but I just really wanna give kudos to the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association, member Gold, the, uh, the Bridge Street um, PTO, um, Principal Chiquette, just everybody working collaboratively. It was really amazing. Thank you very much. Um, and the next uh, member with their hand up is Member Gold. Uh, thank you, uh, Member Sarafi Cox. That was uh, also something to share. And, and Member Sarafi Cox and I are both are on the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association. She had a huge part in, in helping to make this happen as well. So it was really exciting. And so all I want to do on a, on a bright note is uh, for those of you who have, don't get around, uh, if you don't mind, I'm sharing my screen there. And there's our brand new sign that went up. Um, and shared, uh, as you can see, the Bridge Street School has a message up there, the Neighborhood Association does, and really an attempt to celebrate the great things going on at Bridge Street School and neighborhood. And so um, it's really exciting and it was completed officially today. Thank you very much, uh, Member Golden. Obviously, thank you to the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association. Is there any other um, members who have announcements to make this evening? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll move on to our consent agenda. And we have a series of, uh, we actually only have one recommended action this evening. Um, and that is the donation from Edwards Church um, for uh, air filters and internet connectivity for ELL families um, in the amount of $3,000. So that's the one item we have on our consent agenda. And I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, there's been a motion uh, made by Member Gold and seconded by Member Levy. Um, this is our consent agenda, so there's generally uh, no discussion on it. So I'll ask the clerk to call the roll um, for voting in uh, on the consent agenda. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Member Levy? Yes. Sorry. Uh, Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? I, if you said, said it, Member Goldman, I didn't hear you. Yes. Thank you. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. And Mayor Narquist? Yes. Vote is 10 in favor. Okay, so that uh, motion carries and uh, we are obviously grateful to Edwards Church for that very generous donation um, to our ELL families. The next um, items on our agenda are reports and recommendations, and these are these come from our subcommittees, administrators, uh, liaisons, et cetera. And first I'll begin with our rules and policy uh, subcommittee. Um, and uh, member Fallon has a couple of reports uh, about uh, uh, Mass Association of School Committee resolutions, as well as a report from the Collaborative uh, for Educational Services. So I'll turn the floor over to member Fallon. Thank you. Um, so first, I just want to point out that uh, Rules and Policies does have a meeting scheduled for October 27th at 6.30 p.m. The agenda has not been set, but I'm assuming we'll be continuing work on the School Committee Handbook and Section A of Policies. Um, next, I, I hope that you don't mind I take a minute to explain. Uh, so the MASC resolutions um, I do serve on the resolutions committee. That's why I asked the mayor to um, present um, to you. For the new people, just to explain, um, uh, this year 
Um, obviously, due to the pandemic, things are being done differently. Um, the board of directors um, has waived our bylaws in order to allow for the delegate assembly to be held remotely on September, uh, sorry, Saturday, November 7th at 1 p.m. Um, there will be a special program that morning. It's open to all. Um, it is understanding the connection between cultural proficiency and equity. Um, it's free, but you do need to register in advance. Um, but then later at 1 p.m., um, each school committee is only allowed one voting delegate. And so later we'll be voting on both a voting delegate and an alternate. Um, because normally this delegate assembly occurs at the Cape and not everyone is, is able to participate, I would really encourage anyone who's interested to get involved in this. Um, it's a great opportunity. And as I said, it's, it's remote. Um, so at the delegate assembly, um, the delegate would be voting on um, the executive committee, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees Board of Directors is comprised of um, the nine division chairs uh, and the minority caucus chair and then an executive committee. And so the executive committee is elected by the delegate assembly. Normally it's a slate of candidates that's been interviewed by um, a large um, nominations committee this year uh there was no one who filed paperwork to run for president-elect and so there are in fact two candidates that will be running from the floor with the recommendation um they followed the process to be recommended by five other school committees um so you will be voting on those issues as well as approving the minutes from last meeting and the financials uh as far as the resolutions that will be voted on um, I just want to be clear that, um, you know, you have the resolutions in front of you, but anyone can modify them on the floor. So the way we've done it in the past is that either um, the committee just said, we trust you, vote your heart, or the committee has said, we are going to tell you how to vote. Please try to stay as true to our direction as possible. Um, and just to be aware that you, you know, you're told to vote in favor of this while well, this resolution may be amended quite extensively on the floor at the delegate assembly. When you have over 300 school committee members trying to amend a resolution, you can only imagine um, what the end product could look like. Um, and so the resolutions being presented are uh, regarding MCAS and high stakes testing, COVID-19 state funding, school committee anti-racism resolution, which we had already passed, lowering the voting age for municipal elections which we have already passed as a committee um, and supporting increased federal support and stimulus funding for public k-12 through education the retention of medicaid revenue uh, attempts by u.s department of education to direct funding to private schools which has in part been resolved um, and the membership of a school committee member on the board of elementary and secondary education um, providing equity for sexual orientation, LGBTQ plus students, teachers and staff. And finally, uh, relative to the monitoring of attendance of students during the pandemic. So I don't know what the will of the committee is as far as uh, whether you want to um, entrust the, how they vote to your delegate or whether you want to weigh in um, and vote on the slate of resolutions. Um, I see Member Gold has his hand raised. Member Gold, did you have a um, thought or a comment on the resolutions? Uh, yes. I don't know if I have to make a motion or not. Just my thinking would be to say that a representative, um, uh, we give them the power to vote on the slate of them, except for the first one, seeing as though we did discuss uh, that first resolution and we re we revised it because we, as a school committee, were not, uh, we all voted that it wasn't the length, we weren't supporting the full language of it. And so I would say that um, our representatives should vote the slate uh, except for number one. Okay. Um, so do you want to maybe make that as a motion? Sure. Right. I'll make it, yeah. Then, and then I'll make it as a motion. A motion to empower our representative to um, vote the slate um, in, in support of the slate, except for resolution number one. Okay. Um, 
I see another hand, but I first, there's a motion made. Is there a second on that for purposes of discussion or just a second? Second. Okay, there's a second. Um, Member Levy, you have your hand. Thanks, I, I support that motion. I would also just simply add that given that we've already voted to approve the, the resolution on anti-racism, all of those other resolutions with the exception of the language that Member Gold has just, has just mentioned, all those other re resolutions fall in line with the, the resolution towards anti-racism. So if we're really gonna be committed to anti-racism, those other resolutions should, should move forward as well. And that's um, what it, I, th I think an important piece for the representative to bring to the committee if that, if the, or to the, to the body. Okay, thank you. Is there any other um, comments or discussion about the um, MASC resolutions and the motion that's currently on the table. Okay, well, hearing none, oh, I'm sorry, Member Gold? Um, and yeah, so just to clarify, so, and Member Fallon, just correct me, so that means. Oh, shoot. Um, sorry about that, Member Gold. Yeah. I, was, I was trying to lower your hand and I muted you. My uh, oh, okay, cool, no worries, it's all buttons. Um, so just confirm, Member found that and the way it works is that our representative would go and vote in favor or in support of resolutions two through 10, then would not vote in favor of a resolution or not vote in support of resolution number one. That's just making sure that that's how it works there, having never been there before. So, I mean, this is the same thing though that I've mentioned, theoretically. Because once again, we don't know how this will be modified on the floor of the assembly. Gotcha. So, so you, yeah, so we're basically, we see the resolutions as written, but then there could well be multiple amendments to the resolutions um, at the delegate assembly. So there's obviously, there could be changes. Um, so, but again, we're, we're, giving instructions based on what we know now and empowering our, whoever that representative is to make decisions, the best decisions based on their knowledge of our school committee. I think that's the best we can do. Member Busansky. Can't, um, you're not unmuted. Um, oh. Member Busansky, there you are. Yep, sorry. I was gonna sort of make the point I think that you just made mayor, which is that uh, for the resolutions that we've discussed, like the MCAS one, for example, I think the representative, uh, I'd wanna see the representative uh, vote in the spirit of uh, our school committee decision. We discussed it thoroughly, we voted on it. I, we all know where we stand. For other resolutions, I feel comfortable going with the gut of the representative to vote on the resolutions, but. I think where we've stated a clear position, it's important to, I think we want a, our, res, our a representative to support that position. Okay. Any other further discussion on the motion that's before us? Okay, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on that uh, motion, please. Member Fallon. No. Member Serafi Cox. No. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Well, I would like to know more, so I guess I'll vote no. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? No. Member Voss? No. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Uh, yes. Member Busansky? Yes. <clears throat> Vote is five in favor, five against. Hmm, that's what we call a push. So that uh, motion fails because uh, it has to, has, to, has to pass, so no ties. Um, uh, there's no vice president to come in and break the tie. So we, uh, 
So we were back to discussing this. Um, uh, um, member, um, member Levy wanted to know more. So perhaps those who voted against can, uh, Member Serapi Cox, you can inform uh, her. I, I would like to know from Member Fallon uh, why she voted no. Hmm. You know, I'll be honest, I realize, I recognize that we're supposed to support the vote of the of the school committee, but this seems like a rare chance to um, change or rectify a vote that I was I was not pleased with. I actually support this resolution. I voted in favor of the MCAS and high stakes testing resolution while I was on the um, resolutions committee. And again, as a member of the board of directors of the MASD, I helped to write the resolution. Um, so I actually support it and I regret sort of trying to reach a compromise position with the full committee. And that's why I voted no, because I actually am in favor of it. Okay, Member Goldman. Member Fallon, can you remind me the date of the um, assembly? Uh, November 7th, it's a Saturday. Okay, I was just thinking about how we had discussed maybe taking a diver deep into um, the testing and discussing that further, bringing some more education to the committee, including myself around that, um, to sort of, be because it seemed like we had, it had been quite a compromise among the group when we made that resolution. So just seeing how much time we had to consider that, but not much. Member Levy, you have your hand up next. Um, okay, so I I will admit that I had kind of forgotten the um, the exact changes that we had made to our own language with that resolution. So I um, would put forward the motion to ask our delegate to support all of these resolutions, given that all of them support the resolution we have already passed towards anti-racism. Okay, so there's been a motion made this time by Member Levy um, and asking, empowering our delegate to support all of the MASC uh, resolutions. Um, is there a second on that motion? I'll second it. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded by Member Voss. Any further discussion on that motion? Um, Member Busansky. I mean, I, I guess I'm just a little confused about the direction this conversation has taken. I mean, I think as a body, it's um, the delegate's responsibility to represent the school committee body and, and you know, MCAS, whether, I, well, that's number one. And number two, we don't know yet. We haven't voted on who the delegate is. So I guess if it's, for example, uh, a member Fallon, then she will vote for the MCAS resolution. But if it's, let's just say, Member Gold, I'm sorry to point you out, Ronnie, I can't remember really where you stood on this. He could vote against the MCAS resolution. So what we're really saying is that any resolution that any delegate um, who goes any year to the conference gets to vote however they please and they get to ignore the wishes of the school committee on any resolution that we've passed instead of what I really think is we need to take a step back and say that the delegate's responsibility is to represent the school committee therefore represent the views of the school committee and this just happens to be a resolution that we've already discussed voted on change so uh, that's where i come from on this i'm trying to look at that sort of bigger picture i guess that's all member gold i mean i think member basanski shared what my thinking was although i guess it would be and member basanski or anyone else help me understand this, unless i misunderstood you whether it is member Fallon or myself or any of the other, the rest of us, if we all already voted on the MCAS resolution back in, I don't know what it was, July, and modified it because we voted as a school committee that, that we weren't um, in support of the language as it was written, then whoever represented us would have to represent that motion. That, that, um, resolution that we agreed to, the modified one. 
if, if, I'm, if I get it right. So whether it's Fallon or Maitman or Fallon or myself or anyone else, we would say, you know what, unless resolution number one says what we voted for, we couldn't support it. And, I, and, then I'm, and I also just be confused how we are going to go back on what we voted for. The last thing I want to do tonight is talk about MCAS again, but uh, you know. Okay, Member Fallon. Um, thank you. Yeah, I just want to say a, a couple things. One is um, part of the reason, reason I think we're voting on this is I would, I have no interest in being the delegate. It, it's, I think it's a great opportunity for, I've been at the last, you know, four of the last five years, I think, um, the, what, the year that you weren't, uh, Member Busanski. But I think it is important to know what the will of the committee is, because I certainly would hope that any member, and I know I would, have the integrity to vote the will of the committee. And that's why I asked this for this, this that's why this vote is happening. I certainly am not going to vote my feelings. I'm going to vote the way the committee wants to. And so I guess the comp, like part of the way that the compromise that's going on here, once again, is rather than a straight up no vote on the resolution, whoever the delegate is, could also try to amend the resolution from the floor in the same manner that you amended it um, during our meeting. And I'm just saying that that is a vote that I very much regret. And, and I, this is a symbolic stand for me and I understand your frustration and I don't need to believe it, but that's why I'm voting against it. Member Voss. I, um, I don't remember the exact way we re what, what we said in the summer about the MCAS. So I guess I would need a review on that. But my, my strong feeling remains that um, for this year, the MCAS to me is not worth the time or the money um, based on the fact that we're in a pandemic. And I know, however, I voted was not the will of the committee. The way this statement is worded feels like um, not exactly what we voted on, but perhaps somebody can remind me. Um, and I guess I would say maybe we should reconsider what we support here because it is it, at this level of the delegate, it has to meet so many school committees needs for us to go there and say, oh, well, we agree with much of it, but not all of it seems like um, isn't very compromising. And if we want to say something about how we feel, I wonder if we can find a compromise in this somehow. Um, would Member Fallon or Member Gold maybe just want to remind folks what the, what the compromise was in terms of the modification to the original resolution? I'm looking it up as uh, we speak, just so I don't, I, I feel like I remember what it was, but I don't want to. Um... Okay. Member Condon, did you have a, a question or comment in the meantime? Uh, I did have a, a comment, uh, maybe just a clarifying question to begin. Uh, Member Fallon, you said uh, that there is the possibility of uh, amendments being thrown, uh, put forward right on the floor. Uh, is in, in the past, have you seen that happen for the majority of resolutions? I mean, is it likely that this amendment is going, uh, this resolution is going to be amended by someone else anyways? Uh, how likely? Yeah, yeah you... this particular one, I'm, I'm guessing that, that the moratorium, that one of the amendments being made will probably be to extend that from three years to four years to replicate the language in the Senate bill. Um, and then beyond that, I expect that it, it may be um, a close vote, to be honest. Member so, Serafie Cox. So I'm sorry, we, I'm sorry, Member Condon, go back to you if you're not finished. Yeah, so I mean, so that being said, it, it sounds like it's going, and, and maybe I, my memory isn't completely clear, but it seems like it's going the other direction from the compromise. It seems like our compromise was, if I remember correctly, for a few years, but not necessarily the full length of time. Member Gold, did you find it? I'm still looking. I don't think, I don't see anywhere where we wrote it. And so I have the video playing in the background trying to find. I'm pretty sure that, I'm pretty sure it was one year that 
that it was a moratorium of one year? Um, no, it, it was, there was something else. And remember Gol Goldman, um, she had something there. Remember, there was a whole, like where we removed the whole group of sentences. Um, there was, you know, it was like, there was. Member Seraphy Cox. Um, yes, well, for one thing, I would hope that our uh, school committee clerk would have the notes about that that could help whomever the delegate is going to be to educate themselves before they go to the meeting that I don't need it right now. Thank you. But that that information should be uh, given to the delegates before they go to the meeting so that they can understand what the vote actually was. And um, I would like to offer a friendly amendment to uh, to the motion to say that uh, that that in light of changes that the delegates are empowered to um, to vote with in the spirit of uh, of what they think their colleagues would support. Second. Does Member Levy accept that friendly amendment? I don't know because I'm not sure. So I don't plan on rep running to be this delegate, but if I were the delegate, given this conversation and given my, my hazy memory of, I hear you that the clerk could help us remember, but I'm not sure I 100% would know what this committee would want with mm -hmm. regard to this one. Well, I would posit that the whoever the delegate is could indeed go back to the tape and watch that, but also that uh, our clerk could provide uh, the written uh, resolution as was passed by us to um, refresh our memory. Yeah, so I guess to me, if that is the friendly amendment, then that is, that is, sounds to me kind of exactly the same as what member Golds um, was, was, was suggesting in his first or is this not what you said, Member Gold, that we just voted down or slash tied on? I guess to me, the I, I am I am echoing Member Fallon's, I don't remember how I voted on this, but I am echoing the regret that we didn't have more of a conversation. I think in our last meeting when I talked about the fact that we voted for a resolution on anti-racism, and then in that same meeting, we had votes that did not honor the spirit of that resolution on anti-racism, this is what I was talking about, that as we think about the, the um, standardized testing and what we know about the inequities, I would, I, I support the resolution as it's worded. And I don't know what it, I don't know if we're allowed to change our minds, given that we did vote on this resolution with, with different wording. But to Member Fallon's point, this is perhaps an opportunity for us to say, well, maybe we reconsider given the other stances that we've made and, and where we are now as a school committee. So member Goldman, you had your hand up next, but now it's gone. Member Goldman, go ahead. Member Levy just answered my question. I was just looking for some more information to support um, like explaining the tie between the two resolutions. Okay, member Gold. Um, my apologies, because I feel like this is, it's unfortunate that we're rehashing this right now. Um, mm -hmm. Member Levy, I gotta be honest, like saying that voting for this, saying that voting for this is not supporting our anti-racism stance and anti-bias stance, I feel is completely contradictory. I mean, in this day and age, like it is critically important for our state to know what the impact has been on by this pandemic on student achievement. And that's all that MCAS is doing. It's giving us one data point to say how communities of color, communities of disenfranchised families, the communities that are, um, that are just not all the same to see, hey, how are we doing with this? How, did, how are other kids in other communities functioning with this? I can tell you, honestly, we in Springfield want to know how our kids are doing compared to Lexington compared to Longmeadow, compared to Northampton, compared to Chicopee and Holyoke. It's just all it is is a litmus test. This resolution says not to test kids in this year. And it just would be equivalent to saying, you know what, we just had a huge storm and there's things all in the water. We're not going to test the water though. You know what I mean? Like, like we have to assess it. We have to assess the situation. 
and for you know member Voss, your um, passion for data and research and all that to in regards to the safety and coming back to schools, it's contradictory if we're not going to be looking at the data about the impact of this pandemic on ac academic and student achievement. We all sat in the very first meeting. Our number one priority as a school committee is student achievement. And that's all MCAS is going to do for us is give us a perspective on where our kids in Northampton are at compared to other districts so we understand what the impact of this pandemic was on that. And it's, it's very frustrating that we're doing this again. We already went through this for a long time. Thank you, Member Gold, and I, I do want to caution the school committee that we did not, um, our agenda did not say we'd be litigating the MCAS this evening or relitigating our, our views on the MCAS. So I want to be careful that we're not um, going back to that. Um, and uh, we basically are, there's some resolutions that have been put forward for this delegate assembly of all the MASC um, representatives and um, we're just trying to uh, make a decision on what our, how our delegate should vote or empowering them to vote. So if we could try to keep it to that. Um, so member boss. You're, you're okay. Next. Well, I guess, I don't know if this is a friendly amendment or what I, I, I will not say what I was going to say about the MCAS itself. I, I hear you, Mr. Mayor. And um, what I'm going to suggest is my understanding is what we voted on is not what this says. If there's some overlap, but um, my colleagues have helped me remember a little more about it, it's not exactly the same. I also think your thinking develops as you go. People reflect on the conversation. We probably need a conversation about this in the future, but I would put out there, we need to move on and decide on this, that perhaps we can vote on um, whether or not we're comfortable with the slate as presented with minor changes. We didn't vote on that. We said except for one or something different for one. So I would like, is there something on the floor? Do I need to amend it or make a motion? Well, there's a motion on the floor uh, that's been made and seconded by member Levy to essentially um, instruct our delegate to support all the resolutions. Um, and, uh, but, uh, and then there was a friendly amendment about um, you know, our, our delegate trying to um, do their due diligence and, and ensure that if, you know, amendments happen, that they are reflective of the, um, of what the school committee would support. So that's sort of what's on the floor now. So this would be the, and so we've already voted on one version that said vote, vote against the first um, resolution. And that, well, that failed for lack of a, a majority support. So now we're back to a second motion that says support them as is. So, so I guess what, what I'm saying is I am supporting the motion on the floor because I don't think we actually voted on number one and it was different wording and mm -hmm. we can re vote on it. Okay. Well, this would effectively be that. So um, member Levy, did you have anything else to add to your motion or would we want to take a vote on it? Ready to vote, and I will also uh, keep my comments that I was going to make uh, because of your reminder. So uh, I'll bring it up when we talk about our retreat. Okay, Member Kaufman, did you have anything to add? Um, I was going to make a motion, so I think I missed the motion. So maybe <laughs> if so, there was a mo Levy, there was a motion that. made by Member Levy that had been seconded. Um, to instruct uh, whoever the delegate is to support all of the resolutions. Obviously, understanding that there could be amendments and that you know they would have to then um, make decisions, um, you know, on the fly, as it were, um, that would be reflective of what the school committee would support. But that's the so basically what's on the floor right now is a motion to endorse the um, the resolutions as they currently stand. Okay, maybe I can just ask Member Levy if she would consider uh, having two votes, one on resolutions two through 10 and a separate one on resolution one. That's the will of the committee. Well, you can certainly make it, you know, you can, you could, somebody can make a motion to divide the question, I suppose, that, that happens. So if you're moving to divide the question, I can, we can certainly split it that way. 
Well, I think Member Levy has made a motion, so I don't want to interfere with that. So I thought I was making a friendly motion. I apologize if there's okay. a better way, but I just thought it'd be cleaner for people to at least sound like we had a lot of consensus on two through 10. That could be quick and we can have another quick vote on one. I was trying to resolve the issue quickly. I think at, my, at this point, my preference would be to just vote on the motion and then if it fails, then we can do that. Okay. So the uh, maker of the motion does not accept that friendly amendment. Member Busansky. I just want to say I'll, I will have to vote against this motion because I think it goes against the will of the school committee. We've already, we spent a lot of time debating this issue. We heard from, you know, many or all of us spoke on this issue. We voted on this issue. I don't think it's our prerogative to go and just um, change your mind without a full discussion um, on, on supporting resolutions that don't, um, that, you know, aren't in line with the will of the school committee. So I'll be, I guess I will have to vote against this motion then. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Member Gold. Yeah, I just, uh, I second what Member Basansky is saying. And for those of you who, if you, I just want to remind us that we have the option of abstaining. Like if you don't remember what you were, you were, um, what the discussion was, you have an option of, I don't remind us, we can have the option to abstain. Okay, um, great. So um, there's no other hands. Um, and I'll just say for the record, I missed that meeting where you voted on the MCAS. So this will this is a case of first impression for me. So I'll be casting my first vote on this. So let's, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion, please. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. No. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? No. Member Goldman? No. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? No. Mayor Narquist? Yes. Member Busansky? No. And Member Fallon. Yes. The vote is five in favor, five against. <laughs> okay. So, um, Member Levy. Uh, nope, I see Member Kaufman's hand. Oh, I'm sorry, I, Member I, Kaufman. I Your hand was up and then went down. Member Kaufman. You're muted. Member Kaufman. Thank you. I'm going to make a motion that we break the um, vote into two sections. Have a vote on um, two through nine, sorry, two through 10, and a separate one on um, number one. I second. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so, but I think we'd have to do them one at a time then if we're having um, two votes. So you're, so you're, you would move you want to start by moving um, questions, uh, resolutions two through 10? Yes, please. And is there a second? Second. Okay, is there any further discussion or debate? Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. And Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Vote is 10 in favor. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, Member Kaufman, would you like to make another motion? Sure, why not? We'd like to vote on uh, number one. Except, yeah, number one. So, would you, is your motion that you would like the delegate to vote in favor of the uh, motion number one? I'm assuming that's what you mean, right? That you're instructing our delegate to support the um, first resolution. 
It's a good question. Is that the language we used before for the um, original ones? Is it that? No, really that's why we're or? that's why yeah. we're in the mess we're in. Uh, okay, sorry. Right. We, um, we didn't use the same language. Right. I'm going to say. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we um, instruct the representative to support um, the rest the uh, motion that was passed uh, regarding the MCAS previously. Uh, the motion that we passed as a school committee, just want to clarify. Yeah, I think it was in September. If you weren't here, I remember chairing the meeting. Yeah, I think it was September 15th. Yes, and so, okay. Um, and so when you say support that, you mean by offering an amendment or by, I mean, because it may, that's not clearly not going to be the resolution on the floor. So they right. don't. Okay, so I'll add to that in lieu of the current number one. Okay, is there a second? Okay, I, I think I there's a lack. I have a friendly amendment. Okay, well, there, there's not a motion on the floor okay. right now, so you could make a motion then, um, because that member one- Member Condon had his hand up first, so he, I, okay, I, member, I can member, reword it if that isn't what he's doing. It's up to what he's doing. Member Condon. Uh, my hand is not di directly raised uh, to Member Kaufman's motion. So yeah, well, I, I will let Member Voss go. Okay. okay, and my hand was also up because I had another comment, but in light of this, I will make the motion that the delegate um, support number one in the matter we're addressing right now. Okay, is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay. Uh, is there any further discussion we have? I think I've seen this movie before. I think we just voted on this, but. Uh, that is um, why my hand was up. It okay. Uh, so. May, 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 I, may I go? That is why my hand was up. Not to make oh, okay. a but because I thought I was going to be commenting on Member Kaufman's motion. So you took my hand down. Okay. okay. Um, so. Okay, so do you want to offer a friendly amendment and or? No, I think I ended up with the motion and someone seconded, but I wanted to make a comment on it before. We okay, sure. It. Fine. Sure. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. And my comment is, um, while we don't know the exact wording over the summer, and I appreciate if somebody tells me if I'm wrong, my memory is that there were things in what we were voting on, and it was before September, I think it was in July, maybe. Um, of, on the MCAS that had to do with supporting some legislation. And I believe it had to do with a moratorium on the MCAS for several years. And my reading on what's on the table right now is just this year. And to me, that's a very different conversation. Um, and, and I appreciate the point of trying to understand where our children are, but this is not a normal year. And for us to use resources, which include time and teachers time, testing MCAS this year um, when uh, under the conditions we're in doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And, and I'll quote, not exactly, but some public comment we heard tonight about the need to assess our kids in our schools. And when I, when I learned about what our teachers and others do in our schools to assess our kids, I think we're gonna get a lot better information in that way. And I would really support that in understanding where we're at after a tumultuous year that is just awful. So that's why I feel like these two are different and that it would be reasonable for the committee to, recon to consider how they feel about what's on the table right now for one year in this particular circumstance. Uh, uh, okay, I just, but I do wanna just clarify your motion would support the M MASC resolution, which is not a one-year moratorium. Am I am I miss am I not understanding that correctly? Correct. Am I reading? So, no, I, I'm I'm my I'm supporting what the MSAC is asking for. Okay. Okay. Please. And it um. Okay, fine. Um, 
so is that motion's been made and seconded. Um, is there, Member Condon, you have a comment. Yes, uh, I just wanna say uh, several members have expressed that they wish there would be more discussion on it. When this resolution was first discussed, Member Gold and several other of us specifically suggested having more conversation on it. And people dismissed that and wanted to move ahead with the vote then. So I'm not sure that now is the time to revisit it when we tried to talk about it at that point. It's, it's what I'd like to add to the discussion. Okay, Member Busansky. I just wanted to clarify, Member Voss, in the very last sentence, it is really just right at the end of the last sentence, it says um, to enact a moratorium on high stakes testing for of three years. So I understand your point about one year, and I think that's what we agreed to in our resolution. And that was, I think, was the comp great compromise that's been referenced was instead of asking for three years, just a moratorium on one year. And I'm seeing some heads nodding. So but it's very buried. It's the very last clause of the resolution. Thank you. I, 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 I'm trying to put together what happened in July and now, and I'm obviously failing at that, so thank you. So there's a motion on the table to, to support the MASC resolution. Um, it's been seconded. Um, and so, but I just want to be clear that the, we all understand what the MASC resolution says and it's not what we passed. So, um, member gold, did you have a question? Is there an amend, is there a motion on is Ms. member Voss's motion is on the table right now, right? That's correct. Can I make a friendly amendment to the resolution member Voss? Sure. Okay. Um, this is the resolution as it stands. Um, and the big part that I think we all talked about were, was striking out this idea. Um, and so I offer this as a, a um, friendly amendment to take out this, that the students of 2022, um, that they won't be, that they, they still will be held harmless, but they still should take the MCAS. So that takes out that line. They should take it, but they'll be held harmless and that we um, get rid of the whole end of it, sort of as Member Bosansky was saying, is a big part of what we agreed on already. So accepting everything in it, specifically the held harmless for the, the, the kids who, um, for that year. So that's a request for a friendly amendment. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I think what I'll say is while I don't agree with that, I hear you and others saying we need more discussion and since we did have a vote in the summer, I'll accept it. Okay, so do you want to with, do you want to move forward with your motion or do you want to withdraw it in lieu of that other longer discussion? I guess I'll withdraw it and ask Member Gold if he wants, if, if anybody else wants to make a motion consistent with this conversation. Um, Member Fallon, you have a question? Yeah, I was just, I was just going to say that pulling up the original resolution, I honestly believe that the compromise that was made was on that three to four year moratorium and the fact that our original resolution referenced the, the Senate and House legislation that was actually um, being um, that was actually under discussion at the time. And that we also, in our resolution, um, called for the creation of the special commission on the school and district evaluation system, assessment interest, assessment instruments, et cetera. And so these aren't the same resolutions. Um, and that the part that I think that Member Gold is the most was the most struggling with that we compromised on was that three-year moratorium. And I think that we did compromise by saying it would be a one-year moratorium. Um, and I can't find the exact language, but I'm saying this is why I'm not automatically approving it. They were different resolutions. They were different enough that I'm not gonna say that 
that we've already voted on this because we haven't because they are too different. They are similar, but they are different. And the part that we did compromise on was only that very last part that says we urge the legislature to enact a moratorium on high stakes testing of three years. Um, Member Gold is out of hand. Um, yeah, so I can, this, this was the previous resolution right here is what it was. If you guys can see it, sorry if it's not. And we struck out a big part was, and this is something, and I don't remember Goldman, if you remember, cause you were trying to find a compromise there. And if I'm not mistaken, we struck out this whole thing about the three or four year moratorium. We struck out this part here. And what I'm suggesting is, um, can we take, can we do that again? Cause this last part as the mayor pointed out to act a moratorium on high stakes testing for three years. That's what this still says. So you're right. What they did was the MASC did was in a way to accept the pulled, pulled it in, excuse me, pulled in the, um, they pulled in this blue highlighted part. So in a way, like what we struck out, the MSC's new resolution pulls into it because. Right, but the, the, your, the part that you're crossing off that I'm objecting to the absolute most strongly is the first part. You're not just striking out in the resolution the part about three to four years, you're, ta you're saying you are fine with MCAS testing this year. And I think that's absolutely insane. Yeah, and I'm just saying I'm, I'm okay with it as long as the kids are he held harmless. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm fully- I mean, us. you I'm see what's kidding. going on to try to just do common assessments this week where you need a parent present and an extra device and that is not equitable. I can't imagine trying to do MCAS if we're in a hybrid or remote model. That's all I'm saying. So I think yeah. it's, I, I, I can see compromising just to get on with this meeting once again on that three year moratorium, but not on the, the moratorium for high stakes testing for this school year, because that's, that is, I can't even, I can't wrap my head around trying to have our students take MCAS this spring. Member Busansky. Um, I'd like to suggest if we might be able to move this uh, number one question to one of a, maybe our next meeting or the meeting after that, where we could actually all look at the resolution that we approved and that might really help the conversation. Uh, you know, my memory is closer to, I think, member Fallon's where we struck the three years, but we did keep the more, we did request the more or implore that there be a moratorium on MCAS testing for this year, as well as the, anyway, so I think there's just a lot of confusion and we're all just talking on sort of some speculation and, and if we could just get a copy of the final My only question would be when I, is, when is might, the delegate assembly, because I think that's the question, when October is that? October 30th, we have to submit, but you can, you can, the delegate assembly is November 7th, and you need to do, send in your forms for the delegate by um, October 30th. So we can send, we can still send in our form for the delegate, though at this point, I'm not sure who would want to be the, no, just kidding. But um, uh, at least we could just resolve this issue of, uh, on this question. It seems like we have some time. And we sort that of need- That sounds great. What the resolution is that we voted on. Okay. So are you tabling it? I guess I'm, yes, asking- or postponing it? Postpone table. So, okay, so the, we voted on two through 10 and we want to defer action on, on number one until a future meeting. So that's fine. We'll just, we'll defer it. I don't think we need to do, take a vote to table it. We'll just, we'll postpone it. Um, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, I'm going to um, ask if we would consider uh, changing the order of the agenda when, when you and I and Dr. Prevost came up with the agenda setting uh, for t this evening, we anticipated there would be a lot of community members that would like to hear from uh, Dr. Provost, not discuss or vote, but hear from Dr. Provost about the move from um, the, 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 the steps involved, I think, I forget how we said this, I'm not looking at the agenda, um, from moving Nobody. potentially, and I think it's just important that we address the 72 folks from the community. I, I feel like we've learned enough that people are uh, anxious to hear things and most of the rest of our business is school committee stuff. So if it would please the mayor or if we need to take a vote, um, I would. So this would be, this would be number E 
uh, in section seven that you're asking that we would move forward? Correct. Yes. Okay. Operational um, logistics for potential transition to hybrid learning model. So uh, I have member, I'm member sorry, Goldman. but we also have members of a Northampton Education Foundation that have been waiting for a while to present. Um, sorry, I'm got It seems like the whole section is parts and rec. Yeah, so we did, our new business section does have a number of different community members who are here um, to make presentations. Um, Being any affiliates on, I have egg on my face, but I am sorry about that. Okay. I, I um, want to prioritize, but maybe we can switch those two major sections, six and seven. Okay. Um, uh, yes, we're sort of in the middle of section five right now, but I think we can do that. A member Goldman, did you have a question or a comment? I did um, just related to the discussion before um, MCAS, but it sounds like we're going to talk about it later. We're going to continue it, yes. Um, we've con I guess we're continuing it to a future meeting. Um, okay, so then why don't we, um, why don't we um, move away from our internal business then and we'll, we'll take up item, uh, we'll move to section seven, new business, and um, let's take up the, the um, two NEF items, uh, which are the uh, small grants, uh, which we're hoping to hear from Del Melcher, and then the book fund, um, where we're scheduled to hear from Amy Levine. And I'll see if we could, Dale, are you here? Can you, um, can I recognize Dale Melcher from NEF? Dale, are you on the call? I see Amy's on the call. Amy, are you able to unmute and just let us know? Um, hmm. uh, you're muted, Amy. Um, there you I go. Apologize. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not able to speak for Dale. However, I do know that she provided documentation for the committee. I don't know okay. if Lonnie Kauf, if member Kaufman um, feels comfortable presenting that to the committee in her absence or not. Or if not, I can move on to present book fund quickly. Okay. Um, so we, we were presented with the small grant summaries um, and typically Dale would give us just a quick thumbnail sketch of them. Um, so if uh, Member Kaufman as the liaison, would you want to um, make a motion to um, accept those gifts? Maybe provide a quick just overview summary of, of the number and, si and size of those um, grants just for the public and make a motion that the school committee um, accept accepts them? Um. Thank you for the idea, Amy. I actually think Dale would appreciate the time to do that. So why don't, why don't we just continue and when she rejoins, we could recognize that. I think she probably just left in order to, because we were we were behind. I think Dale will probably rejoin and I'd like to give her that opportunity and just skip to Amy's part. Okay, so we'll go to Amy next then, please, to the book fund. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I, um, the Northampton Education Foundation would like to present to the Northampton um, school district, our book fund in the amount of $9,569.69. Um, this money was raised primarily through our um, appeal that goes out with the city census. Um, we have a second fundraiser yearly in the spring, the plant sale, plant and garden market at Smith Vocational. That was canceled this May um, because of the pandemic. We did sell some plants online, um, but not at the scale we normally do. So the money we raised is lower than in previous years. However, since the money um, from last year was presented in the winter instead of the fall, um, and then schools shut down in March, many schools did not place orders. So um, the chart that you see on the documentation I provided can explain what's available, or if, if you vote to accept this money, what will be available to schools. 
um, to use for um, books and other resources, including some digital learning resources. Let me know if you have any questions before the vote. Are there any questions about the um, book fund allocation? If not, I would entertain a motion to um, accept the book fund um, gifts from NEF. So moved. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded um, to accept the um, recommended uh, book fund allocation from NEF. Um, is there any discussion about that? Okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes, and Dale's going to join us in a minute. I just called him. Uh, Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes, and thank you. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narquist? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Seraphie Cox? Yes. And Member Condon? Yes. The vote is 10 in favor. Okay, um, so that, that is unanimous and thank you so much, uh, Amy, and thank you to NEF. Um, so um, I think we were waiting for Dale to rejoin us. Um, I don't see her yet. Um, so um, uh, why don't we move to item D while we're waiting for that. I think that's one that we can probably, um, I'm hopeful we can dispense with quickly, which is the approval of the MOA for bus driver uh, pay. Um, would someone like to make a motion, member Seraphie Cox? I would be happy to make that motion, but it was my understanding that the suggestion was to move to the superintendent's report. Is that not what the suggestion was before? It was, except that we had other members of the community that were that were waiting to make presentations, so we were just trying to get through them. But but um, but so I, the, was, I mean, I guess Cami would be the person making the presentation. But yeah, yeah, she's not a member necessarily of the public. Public. I was just I was anticipating that Dale Melcher would be getting on the call, and I didn't want to make her wait, ask her to get on the call, and then make her wait forty five minutes to make the presentation. So I was I was trying to fill time with what I thought would be a quick quicker vote. So got it. Um, okay. That's all. That was my thinking. Um, okay. I would, and, then I would be happy to make the motion to approve the MOA for bus driver pay. And I just want to um, say publicly that, uh, that this MOA uh, is in regard to the four bus drivers that are employed by uh, the district uh, and not in relation to the, um, the uh, sorry, what's the name of the company that we utilize? Durham, Durham thank you. Uh, uh, the Durham bus drivers. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, I don't think we need any further explanation on this one, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Seraphie Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. And Member Levy? Yes. The vote is in favor. Annie, you skipped me. Oh, Member Fallon, my apologies. Yes. <laughs> okay, so the vote is unanimous. Um, um, do you, has, has Dale Melcher signed in yet or not? Um, I don't sure? I have time. not. Okay, well, um, Member Gold, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, seeing as she didn't sign on, I'm I've been on the small grants committee before. Can I just make a motion to approve the $10,320 for the four projects just so we don't hold that up? 
you certainly can. I'd like to make a motion to approve the NEFs for, and if she does come on later, she's welcome to share, but um, motion to approve the four grants for $10,320 um, from NEF, a gift from NEF. Second. Okay, is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay, um, any discussion? I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Yeah. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. And Member Kaufman? Yes. The vote is 10 in favor and Dale Melcher is joining us right now. That's not Tyler. Hi, Dale. She's, she's coming on still, I think. Dale, are you on the call? Hi, Dale. Dale, you can um, unmute yourself. Um, uh, this is a little awkward, but um, we we actually just voted to approve the grants. Um, right. but, but we, <laughs> if you wanted to say any, if you wanted to say anything quickly about them, you 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 would have that opportunity now. No, I don't need to say anything. Thank you for accepting the gifts. We were delighted to fund those three, and we have several more to consider. Today's the deadline at midnight. So we'll get back to you with our round two grants. Okay. Um, thank you. I hope we'll be done by midnight. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dale. Thank you so much. And again, thank you to NEF. Um, so um, we now have two remaining items under this section seven. We have the presentation and vote on parks and recreation facility use. And then we have the update from the superintendent. Um, I guess I'm looking for guidance. I know we have community members that are here for both of those items. And so um, I'm looking for guidance on that. Okay. I'm going to go um, I'm going to go with the order and, and I'm going to turn to Anne-Marie Moggio from Parks and Recreation and, um, and have her um, uh, talk to us about the request to use the Parks and Rec facilities. Okay, am I on there? You are, Anne-Marie. Okay, good evening. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I wrote you all an email that sort of outlined uh, of some of the programs and opportunities that we're hoping to utilize the facilities for this uh, winter. So this summer, Parks and Rec, we worked hard to provide um, a lot of essential recreation programs for our community, for both kids and the adults. We ran a lot of successful programs, a wide variety, and we worked close with our health department to ensure the safety and, and to make sure that all of our local and state guidelines were being met. And when programming first started, you could see right away that the impact and the need was huge, um, especially for our children's mental and physical health, our exercise, and the, especially their socialization. One of the practices, one of the first things that happened was the kids just wanted to sit down and talk. They just wanted to be with each other and as a group and socialize. And programs have continued throughout the summer and fall very successfully. We've had adult programs going on also, as well as a variety of kids programs, new programs, a whole bunch of different things going on. So uh, our feedback has been uh, well, it's been, it's all been well received by the public and everything seems to be going along really smoothly. As the cooler months approach, our primary facilities that we use to run the programs is the schools. As I mentioned in my email to you all, we're asking for uh, evening and weekend use of some of the gyms in the community. We have typically used the elementary schools and JFK Middle School. And those are the places that we'd like to offer rec recreational programs. We'd love to be able to space them out at different schools in the community to be able to 
provide in different areas for kids who might not be able to get to perhaps like JFK if that was one of the main sites. Um, so we're hoping to be able to do programs in all of the, all of the elementary schools if we can. Um, weekends, nights, um, when the when the classes aren't taking place, if, if any of the in-school resumes. So we would also like to have access obviously to the pool at JFK. You heard some people speak about that earlier. The YMCA has started their programming successfully and we feel like we could also do the same. The entrance way to JFK, especially we've run, we've run the Aquatic and Family Center there for over been over 20 years. And the entrance in the back of the school, you come in, it's all in one hallway back there with the pool and the gym connected. So it's a nice facility for that. The elementary schools, a lot of them have pretty much easy access right in the door and into the gym. So there isn't, there wouldn't be people going throughout the school or um, in almost all of them, I think we'd be able to do something like that. So, you know, just with the um, vital need in our community for this, for the health of everybody, we're hoping to be able to utilize these indoor spaces um, starting next month if we could. So that's what I have. Uh, thank you so much, um, um, Parks and Rec Director Mogio. Um, does anyone have any questions for um, um, Ms. Mogio? I know we've heard lots of, we've gotten lots of public input, particularly from swimmers in the community who are anxious uh, to have the community pool reopened. Um, are there any questions? And if there are no, uh, uh, Member Gold. Um, I was actually, sorry, you said questions. I was going to make a motion to approve. Please, I, I would take questions yep. and I would especially take a motion. Okay, motion uh, to approve um, Parks and Rec's facility use request. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay, there's a second. Um, are there additional questions? Um, Member Busansky. Yes, thanks. Um, I guess I want to, I'd like to just understand, thank you for the presentation. And I also do want to really commend Parks and Rec. I think you came out with a fantastic um, offering this fall. You were really creative and um, that was just really great to see. And I was, yeah, I was very impressed. So I'm glad that people um, took you up, have, you know, taken advantage of the outdoor knitting and volleyball and all that. Um, but I just kind of wanted to understand the schedule better. And um, so from what we got in our packet, it would be the JFK pool. Um, and then it would be using every gym. From it. So one, two, three. So f at each elementary school from five to 9 p.m. Is that right? On weeknights. So Gen in general, I would say that is what we would like to use. We've always worked with the schools, the individual schools, as to what their programming needs were. They obviously would ha have priority over any Parks and Rec programs. So say there was some special event that had to take place or a meeting that had to be in there, um, we would be, you know, we would um, postpone our event for that night or our program for that night and move around. So we would work with the school principals, you know, closely and central services for what, um, with, with um, custodians, who's available on the weekends, we have to, we, um, you know, some of the schools we use, we have to make sure custodians are available and pay, pay for those too. So, um, you know, it would be around what the school's need would be. But yeah, in general, that's the time frame that we've offered community programs. Um, and I get, I get how this swimming, you know, I guess how get how easily the lane, it can work with the lanes and all that, but how does it work in the locker room? Are people going to be allowed to use the locker rooms in this proposal or not? They would be, we haven't gone into detail with how it would work. Like if you, um, how many would be able to be in there at a time or how the, um, if you, you know, depending on if people had reservations to come in for swimming and all that, we haven't gotten into the dirty details yet until we knew we were able to move forward and, um, and be able to start thinking about those things in, in, in more detail. But um, we would certainly follow all the guidelines with the health department, um, such as like the YMCA does. 
um, in town. So mm -hmm. they've set up, set up some standards already. And for the gym use, is that also, or do you have any numbers on that or you haven't gotten into that either, what the capacity would be? Um, there is specific, the state has specific guidelines for how many people can be on a court, in a, in a, on a field, how many feet apart you have to be if there's two courts, how many feet apart you have to be from each other. So they have very specific guidelines to that. And then our own health department is also, as you all know, very um, diligent about even setting stricter guidelines than the state sometimes has. Um, so, you know, we, we would work with them with all of that and follow, you know, whatever they, whatever we were at with them. Okay, and then just, um, I just had a question about the budget and maybe you answered it. Do you pay for the custodial services that, or does that come from the school budget? And maybe Dr. Provost can, or either one of you could answer it perhaps, how it impacts our budget. Sure. When custodians are on duty, they're already there in the schools. Um, we, we're not because they're there. They're already um, assigned and working. And so on the weekends, if, if it's a school that does not have a custodian assigned on the weekend, um, JFK has one through Central Services. I'm not sure um, Dr. Provost would have to speak to how that is. But on the weekends, JFK has had one through Central Services um, part-time on Saturday and Sundays. But they... Um, Take care of the pool also, which always has has to be checked on, even if people are in it or not. Yeah. Um, um, but and then so we would pay if it was a, like, say we use Jackson Street School on a Saturday. There wasn't normally a custodian, so we would pay the time and the half and build that into our budget. Got it. I'm pretty sure the city funds that weekend custodian. Correct, Dr. Provost at JFK as part of the rec program. Uh, I, I'm actually, if you, with your indulgence, would ask Cami to speak to that. We have had so many um, MOUs around that issue. I've actually um, forgot where the, the funding source ends up on that custodian. Cami. So we do have a position that was originally scheduled to work the weekend shift, um, but since March, Many of the custodial positions schedules have changed. So they're not working till 10 or 11 o'clock at night any longer because we don't have a volume of students in the buildings any longer right now. Um, so I don't know if we actually have a custodian working all weekend like we did before. And we have a number of people that are also out. So those are more the logistics we'll have to work through as part of this. Correct. To make sure there's coverage if there's people in the building. And if, you, if I could for one moment, so I don't have to jump back in later, I, I did want to remind the committee that we do have an MOA with NACE that outlines some of this that we may want to take a look at before you make a motion to approve anything. Okay. Um, Dr. Provost. That actually is what my hand was up for. I, I would just say I'm in favor of this proposal, but it would require some modifications of the MOA. Okay, Member Boss. Um, I guess I have more questions than um, thoughts. I'm still thinking. Um, I want it, I really wanted be in favor of this and I am, my gut is in favor of it, but I just have concerns that I think we need to consider and talk through at some point, such as our goal is to get our kids back to school. And so putting people in gyms close together um, worries me. And I, I, I know we have to figure out how to do this safely. And it sound, it's helpful, Amory, because you're saying you're gonna follow the state protocol. So presumably if the state says, kids can't be playing basketball, we're not going to have them playing basketball in the gym. So I just need to hear a little more about that. And um, it would help me from the swimmer's perspective. What helped in the emails was following USA swimming guidelines. And I happen to know a lot about those and I've been reading about them. Um, but I do think a lot of times, and correct me if I'm wrong, swim teams do have them not use the locker room. And we even heard about that in public comment. And I I just really want everything to be done in a way that we don't spread COVID here so that our schools can be, stay open when they open for more. 
Um, and in that regard, we've been working really hard with NACE and our custodians have different um, wording than they used to. So I don't know that it's going back to the way it used to be. And I guess I'd wanna say if custodians aren't working under their normal contract, can Parks and Recs take care of that and pay for it and work it out? Um, so if Parks and Recs are using these facilities and it's not when any of us are in school and they're really following the strictest guidelines to keep COVID out, that, that helps me a lot. Sure. The, the state's guidelines that you mentioned, there are, they have different phases, different steps. It's very, it, it's very detailed. And like you said, basketball, there's certain things that are the high risk, the moderate risk, the low risk. And they're all based on that. And they have some of them, depending on, you know, as we know, things change frequently. And um, sometimes, you know, they are, they're, some of them are so strict that they're not, you're not even allowed to have games or scrimmages. You're allowed to have like for basketball, I'm not 100% sure right now what it is, but at one point you couldn't even like you had to have your cohort of so many people for a for a high risk sport, and that was it. And those who were together, and you couldn't play games. And then if you did, you know, everyone has to wear a mask um, pretty much all the time for many of the sports um, that are happening, um, except for swimming. <laughs> um, and yep, can we can the gyms? keep their doors open and have fans blowing fresh air in? Do they do things like that? Um, I'm not sure about that. I'm not, I don't know if they've, I mean, I don't, we would work with um, central services and whoever to do, you know, if they would allow us to do things like that. And if it was feasible to do that in the gyms, you know, I mean, anything wow we could do to be able to have people in there safely, you know, more safely. Um, when you mentioned the custodians, we're, we, we're based, our, our budget is, um, and our, our program is based on fees, is fee-based. So anything we do, we charge a fee to cover the cost for. So if there is custodian cost, it's built into the fee. So if, you know, there, if custodian hours have changed and they're not in there at certain times um, and can't, can't do the, you know, aren't, aren't there until seven o'clock at night and they're all leaving at four, you know, if there was a possibility to do an overtime shift from four to seven, then we would, we would take on that. Thank you. Member Sarah P. Cox. Thank you. Um, I'm not actually sure that I agree that uh, this would require a, a change to the MOA uh, with NACE, but I would be happy to add it uh, as the chair of the negotiation subcommittee. I would be happy to add it to our agenda for our meeting that is scheduled for next Wednesday. Um, and uh, we can we can check in with NACE at that time. Um, so I don't think that we should make a decision tonight based on concerns about the MOA. Um, and then uh, also, I've been looking and looking and looking, um, um, and I don't see an email from you, Anne-Marie. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if it was something that was sent to the clerk and perhaps it got left off emails, but I, I can't find it. So the things you were referencing that you've oh. told us, I, I can't find it myself. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. So I, no, I, put it, I put it in the packet uh, as a separate document. So I, I took Anne-Marie's email, put it in a document, and included it in the packet. Oh, oh, in only on the Google Drive, I assume. Right, then. on the Google Drive, right. Okay, I was not looking on the Google Drive. Thank you. That is a new practice that was just implemented, so that is why I didn't see it. Thank you. Okay. Member Gold. Can I make uh, an amendment to the motion to approve a contingent upon um, approval of the MOA, if necessary, as Cami was saying, like a, a NACE approving it in our MOA. We have a meeting on Wednesday. 14th. So can I make a motion to approve the facility use contingent on the MOA unless Dr. Provost you got something there looks like. Dr. Provost. Sorry, thank you for recognizing me. I, I just wanted to clarify my earlier comments. I'm in favor of the um, the use of the pool. I'm, I do have some reservations about the gymnasiums. Um, we under the current agreement can't even have our own staff in the gymnasiums. And so I think, I think that is a little bit of a different situation. 
Um, I think in the pool, you have such high air exchange. I'm not, we, we didn't actually measure it, but I know that there's a dedicated air handler just to the pool. So um, that thing is constantly running to evacuate chlorine from that, that area. Um, somewhat, somewhat less confident about the gymnasium, uh, at least until we feel comfortable using it ourselves. Okay. <clears throat> Um, Member Kaufman. Yeah, I, Dr. Provost, I think that maybe that's what I was going to ask. So can you just verify, like right now, is anybody using the pool or the, or the gyms at the respective schools? No. And so if we move to hybrid in our current reopening model, um, could potentially, I guess, just the, well, either, either facility, particularly the gyms for instruction, I mean, do you envision there being a move to, um, use the gym or the pools if and when we move to a hybrid model? Yes, I do. Not that I think that that would create a conflict with the park and rec department because they use the pool before or after school and on the weekends. But we would we would be, well, I, let, me, let me rephrase. Under the current air exchange guidelines, we would not be able to use the gym. So um, athletics or, or, or physical education rather would have to take place outside or in some other location. Um, we didn't really talk about the, the pool, but I, I do think that for the reasons I just mentioned, the pool is likely to be an area that we could get approved for use. Right. And if, and if we were able to enhance the air quality or meet the air quality um, regulations, I guess, or agreements, then you do think that our students would probably end up using the gym as well during the hybrid model? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I guess I anticipate this being an issue, and I, and I, and I support the idea, certainly, of a, a member, Serafi Cox, working this out, because, you know, the whole idea of moving into the next phase was to do it slowly and limit the amount of interaction, and we had the, you know, this was more or less the issue that I think that we had, some of the concerns with the why wasn't, it, it, one of the fundamental concerns was just trying to ensure that our staff um, and certainly our students as well would have limited interaction. So if there are other people in the pool and we can't clean it and our students would be going in afterward, it just, it adds another element of concern and probably more so the gym. So I don't want to, I don't want to work with Emory and have her put together a program the next week we move to hybrid and the whole thing blows up. It, does, it seems like I would love for this to work out. I think it fills a lot of the needs that we all want to fill for our community, but I strongly support the idea of getting some, some of these questions answered and maybe even the idea of working around um, our students using those facilities during hybrid if they're gonna have the availability to use it after school. Um, that might be a compromise, but I guess I'm just, I, I feel it'd be premature to vote without knowing specifically what um, some of these reservations and concerns could be handled better. And I say that really out of concern for Anne-Marie as much as anybody, because I don't want you to do all this work. And I feel like, um, well, I just don't want you to do all the work and find out it's not gonna, it's not gonna work out. I really hope it does, but I think we need to put a little bit more time in discussing with our um, colleagues from the union. Member Sarah Cox. Um, I, would like to maybe hear a little bit uh, of if the superintendent um, feels like we could move forward. I think what I would, I liked the way that uh, Member Gold's um, uh, uh, not resolution, uh, mo the motion. motion. Thank you. Uh, what his motion said, um, but I, uh, I, I heard, uh, sorry, I liked the part about that it was contingent on our conversations with NACE, um, but I heard the superintendent say that he has uh, reservations about the gym. So I guess I, I, I know that member Gold's motion is not on the, on, uh, the floor, so I would like to make a motion uh, to move um, approval of use of the pool uh, contingent upon conversations with NACE um, and separate out the gym part uh, because of the superintendent's um, reservations. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, continue conversation and, uh, and Anne-Marie, you know, with the knowledge that things can change rapidly as we have seen. 
not all of that has to be a part of my motion. My motion is just to move the, uh, the pool portion of it contingent upon conversation with me. Okay. So is there a second to the- I'll, with, I'll withdraw my motion. My, so there is a motion that was seconded. I'll withdraw it if that's helpful. Well, I didn't hear a second. Um, I would, second. if it was seconded, I would just offer it as a friendly amendment. So will you accept that as a friendly amendment, Member Gold? Okay, so the, 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 the amendment now before us is on um, approval of the use of the pool facility obviously subject to, you know, the MOU uh, conversation. Um, and then we would take up the gymnasium question um, as we move forward, um, addressing that as part of the other conversations with NACE. Okay. So Member Levy, you have a question. Yeah. Um, Superintendent Provost, what time do students and what time do teachers get into the building at JFK in the morning? So I'm, I'm usually there for student arrival, not staff arrival. Um, but I would, I can tell you by contract, um, the teachers are required to be there. It's either 10 or 15 minutes before the students arrive and the students are arriving at 10 minutes of eight. So I guess to me, and, and I will I will voice that I very much would love to be able to open the pool and the gyms if we can make it work. Um, but I, I concur with Member Voss that my top, top priority is to get our students back into the buildings as safely as possible and as soon as possible. And I'm concerned that we had a, a huge, uh, felt like debacle over the why using our buildings when students and teachers were there, even when they were in separate spaces that were, were divided by firewalls and we had a whole host of safety agreements. And I was pretty um, disheartened that we couldn't find a way to make that program work, which would serve our um, working families and, and families that need childcare. And I, I guess I, I, it feels, I, I, again, I want people to swim, but it feels really, um, it, it, to me, it doesn't feel right to say, we'll open the building so that people can swim, but we won't, won't open the building so that we can care for our students. And I would want to ensure that if we were opening the building so that people could swim, that there would be absolutely no overlap, that there would be time in between when people are leaving the building from the pool and when our students and teachers are arriving, such that the airflow could be cleared out. Uh, I just, it, to me, it's really important that, that the safety of our students and teachers come first. And if we're willing to have people in the pool swimming, then we should have a wide program caring for our kids. I just wanna clarify, and maybe Dr. Provost or um, Anne-Marie can clarify, the pool entrance is separate from the building entrance, correct? We have a sep do we have a, we have a dedicated separate entrance for the aquatic facility that's not the main entrance to JFK. So students would be entering from a totally different, and it's actually somewhat uh, cordoned off from the rest of the building, or can be cordoned off from the rest of the building. So just for the pool part of it anyway. Sure. Am I mistaken that that was part of the agreement with the Y as well, that it would be a completely different enter entrance in a part of the building that was cordoned off from the rest of the you are correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just mean that was the way the building was designed when we passed an override to create a community pool as part of the JFK. It was sort of that's that was the original design so there could be a community pool. Um, so there's a motion that's on the table that's been seconded. Dr. Provost, did you have an additional comment? Just had a question. Um, getting back to Member Levy's question, we actually have students who start arriving on buses seven th at 7.30. So they're around, you know, for a while before school actually starts, which prompts me to ask Anne Marie, would it work if we started just with the evening program so that we didn't have that potential um, intermingling of people getting out of the pool while, while students are arriving? Yeah, we, are, we would love to work with, you know, pretty much anything that we could get the community in there doing. Um, 
and the weekends too is a big time too. So we're not just talking school days and um, early mornings or nighttime. We're talking weekends also. So we have a lot of you know weekend programs with swim lessons and and different kinds of kids and adult programs. So um, anything. I mean, obviously we would work around so that whatever you thought would be best, we would be willing to do. Member Sarah Cox. Uh, so just uh, to to change the motion to reflect the conversation that just happened uh, around um, no overlap so that the times would be um, um, in the evening and weekend. No overlap with students and staff. Or no overlap with the students and staff other than the custodians who are supposed to be there. <laughs> okay, so then the motion is to approve use of the audit aquatic facility subject to the MOA and provided that there be no overlap with students and faculty. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Does that okay. uh, uh, illustrate your um, what you were thinking, John, uh, Superintendent Provost? It does. Thank you. Thank you. Member Voss. Um, I would just add, if we go ahead with this motion, I would I'm looking for you, Emory. There you are. Um, does it make sense for us to consider saying the swimmers would be out of there by some time in the morning? Swimmers actually get up very early, and running a pool is expensive. So if we're going to open the pool, I wonder if we want to extend this to say, can the pool be open? I'll throw it out there. I don't care what time you all choose, 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. Is that? I don't see any difference in that in the evening. And if you can get people who want to lifeguard and custod perform whatever we need at those times and we're clear of students and teachers, um, it feels reasonable to me. Swimmers do like early morning. They, um, we typically started in the past at 5.45, uh, the lifeguards would get there um, and be, and then we would have different times. Sometimes they're out at 7.30, sometimes eight. But if you have students coming in at seven, um, and it was part of, you know, something that was agreed to, we could certainly try to see if we could get a program in there at, you know, 545 for an hour, hour and a half or something before anyone is, is coming in. Um, it's also contingent on the custodian in the morning, but they were, they were usually there at 530, I believe. So we would work, try to work with anything that we could get in the morning because those early morning swimmers love those early morning swims. <laughs> So may I offer okay. that as a friendly amendment to this ongoing amendment? So I'm, I'm not, so is your amendment putting some specific times? I don't think that her uh, suggestion is in conflict with my motion. Okay. So then someone else restate it because I don't understand it. So I'll have you restate it since it was your motion. I'm so my to... motion was just that there not be any overlap. And uh, member Voss is suggesting a way to Anne Marie that she achieve that. Okay, so it's not changing the motion. It's, it's just... not changing the motion. Okay. I was I was simply clarifying just so nobody came back and questioned it that no overlap could also mean earlier in the morning. Thank you. Okay. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Uh, yes, and I don't know if Member Condon's gone back in yet. He sent me a message that he's um, his internet went down, so he might not be able to vote now. Uh, unless you want him to do it on the speaker or something. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Oh, he's not here. Uh, Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. And Member Goldman? Yes. The vote is nine in favor. Okay, so um, thank you, um, Anne Marie Mogio, for being with us tonight. And obviously, this will be an ongoing conversation about the pool as well as other facilities going forward. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Now we'll turn to um, item E in section seven, which is an update from Dr. Provost on operational 
logistics for a potential transition to hybrid learning model. Thanks very much. Just unmuting myself here. So there's a vote for a potential transition to a different learning model plan for the meeting next Thursday. According to the motion passed by the school committee some time ago, the transition can take place no sooner than next month. Some have asked why I would need so much lead time to implement a change of model. To answer those questions, I'd like to go through some of the things that I would need to do in order to get ready for the transition. First, we would need a very accurate account of the students who, take, who would take advantage of the opportunity for in-person instruction. We've polled families several times about this, but we've seen that there's a great deal of variance each time we ask. So we would need to reach out again to get a current and reliable number to use for the rest of the action steps. Next, we need to call up staff. We are already involuntarily transferring staff just to meet the staffing needs for the remote plan. So my assumption is that all the staff needed for a hybrid model would need to be involuntarily transferred. This can be a lengthy process because staff called back sometimes decline the position due to COVID related issues, requiring us to start the process all over again with the next person on the seniority list. And then if there are insufficient numbers of staff who are able to return to work, we may have to replace staff who are not able to report to work or contract out positions, which would involve further delays and further increases of cost. Then we have to develop the bus routes. On the 15th, I'll be asking you to adopt the state guidelines of one student per seat instead of the current six foot rule we're using on the buses. If that recommendation is rejected, we'd have to create an entirely new transportation model. Even with, and we have started working on that. To our best estimate at this time is even without transporting students in grades seven through 12, we would probably need a four tier system um, with a six foot rule in place. Um, so we would need to have four different start times for the schools um, and we would have to add another tier onto our bus contract. Our transportation providers would also need time to recall their laid off staff and assign them to whatever routes we end up creating. They have a process of bidding on the routes by seniority, so we would have to finalize our routes and get them over to the bus company so that they could communicate them to their union and allow their, their staff to, to bid on the routes. So then the school committee would also have an obligation to bargain the impacts of these changes with NACE. Um, and although neither Cami or I are negotiators, we attend all those sessions, which will take time away from the other tasks I just described. Um, and then you can see those tasks alone are quite labor intensive. A critical component of those negotiations would have to be adopting a different set of requirements for air exchange, bringing us back to our last conversation. Under the current rules in our, in our agreement, we have waiting lists at schools because we've maxed out the usable space under our MOA. And those negotiations would have to proceed under a very tight timeline. In my estimation, bargaining for any longer than one week after the vote on the 15th would make it impossible to transition um, anytime in November. Finally, um, we'd have to take care of such rudimentary matters as ordering food and staffing kitchens to feed students who would be back in school. So this is important work and it's work that I hope, hope to have a chance to do soon. But as you can see, none of this is easy and that's why it would take me uh, at least a month after a decision is made in order to be able to put an, a model into action. And I just think it's important for the, the community to understand that. Um, I heard loud and clear in the public comments tonight the desire for a return to in-person instruction as soon as possible. But just to speak to um, that desire, essentially that's what we spend all summer doing. Um, after we close down, there's a short period of vacations in central office, and then we start doing all the things I just described in order to get school ready to go. Typically, we're ready to go a week or two before the opening of school. Um, we'd, be, we'd be trying to compress that all into a month, which I think is extremely um, 
ambitious. We have a chance to do it because we've pre-planned a lot of the things, um, but we also have the unknown variable of negotiations in there, which could um, impact the timing. So I just want the community to understand that if we have a vote next week, um, it won't be like flipping a switch and I won't, buses won't be rolling the next day to bring students into school. There's a tremendous amount of logistics that would have to be lined up. Um, so that's what I wanted to share for this item on the agenda. Member Gold, you had your hand up. Um, it was initially before for getting Member Condon in, but I did um, have questions regarding the presentation, if that's okay. You do or do not? You don't have questions? I do, I do. Okay, now proceed, proceed. Okay, I did have, okay, so I guess I'm wondering, Superintendent Provost, what can we do proactively tonight to um, speed things up? Because, I mean, there's a long list that you gave us. Um, you know, so I'm just trying to like wrap my head around it. I, I, I remember many of them, but um, I'd love to know what can we, res is there anything we can resolve today for you um, that would help expedite things? I think the, the only thing that could really be done tonight is making sure that we have a, um, a fairly aggressive schedule of bargaining. I, I know that the bargaining subcommittee, which you're a member of, has a session in place for next Wednesday. Um, and I would, I would think that it would be helpful to get more dates on the book possibly in the week after um, October 15th so that we could um, try to impact bargain as much of this as possible to make a, um, a transition at least feasible in November. Um, one thing that might be a little bit tricky is the um, impact related to time. Um, schedules schedules um, may be a little bit dicey because we won't actually know how many routes we need to put on until we actually get feedback from the community about how many parents are sending kids under the model we set up. But I think a lot of the other things could be um, impact bargained. And so getting some dates in the calendar, I think, is probably all we can do at this time. Um, the rest are things that require votes that um, are on the draft agenda for next Thursday. Um, so, and then just since I have the floor, so it sounds though, this like, you need to get public feedback and we don't have to vote on that right like so we could you could go ahead and get the numbers that you would need for the buses that's correct you know and it seems like that would be worthwhile um yeah initiate um i mean i guess I, as a member of the negotiation committee i would love you know i want to just and if i'm not mistaken we could vote to either continue remote on thursday or move to hybrid on thursday um but even without the negotiations occurring. We could still make that vote happen on Thursday, next Thursday, um, re regardless of where negotiations are at. Is that correct? That's correct. In the remote model, that's what happened. The school committee made a vote to go to remote before negotiations were concluded. Thank you. That's all I have for now. Member Fallon. Thanks. Um, Superintendent, I understand that you need really specific, accurate numbers to move forward. And what I'm understanding from the community is that because they don't fully understand um, what remote learning would look, for, look like if they opted to choose that rather than move into the hybrid model, or what it's going to look like in their particular school or at their grade level if they do the hybrid model, that they're not certain what to choose. And so I guess my question is, is um, what sort of education can we do so that families can make an informed decision um, so that your numbers are as accurate as possible? So we could uh, continue the process of doing town hall meetings. Um, I would ask the principals to help me with that. Uh, because they have plans that are more developed than they were at the time that we were doing the last set of town hall meetings. And also because, as you can see, I'm going to be busy doing a lot of other things in preparation for a potential move. I can um, share a little bit of information from the survey that's, that's currently out um, and which is closing now. So if anyone has any, um, if anyone wants to respond who hasn't responded, please do it now. I can tell you that we're up to almost 
1,900 responses. And we have only about 20% of people in the unsure range. So I do think that, that there is a group of people who might be unsure and the reason might be because of not understanding the model, but it seems like the vast majority have either said yes or no based on their understanding of the model. Thank you. Member Busanski. Thanks. Um, Dr. Provost, thank you for that update. Um, I wonder if, um, as uh, some people have been suggesting, if the phasing in sort of K through two, et cetera, kind of more slowly would make it easier um, on your end, on the administration's end, to kind of get the pieces into place rather than having everyone K through 12 come back to school at once. Um, well, as you know, one of the original models that I had proposed was starting with elementary um, for many of the same reasons that were discussed in public comment tonight. Um, so that's something that I, we have already thought about. You could even think of smaller chunks of elementary, um, but I, it, it is something that we've contemplated um, and, and may, in fact, may in fact make the transition easier. The, the potential downside is uh, all of the public comment that we've, we've heard from students. Um, you heard from two tonight. I, I'll also share this data. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the results, as you'll see, are ambiguous. People are, are split pretty closely. But the one group that isn't split is students. Um, students are speaking pretty unanimously that they'd like to come back in school. And it's mostly middle and high school students who've responded to the survey. So the one potential downside of starting with a, a smaller chunk and maybe making it elementary students is I do think that students at the high school would feel like their voice ha hasn't been heard. Uh, okay, I mean, I guess we'll have more discussion of this topic next week and I agree, but if it's a different kids back three weeks or having like four or five or six weeks from today to bring all kids back, then I think, anyway, I, you know, maybe coming up with some chunk. I also just think that a kindergartner is probably less likely to fill out the survey. True. <laughs> but my other question is, um, I had a couple parents ask me in the reopening dot plan about um, and I just wonder how this is going to influence or people are questioning and they're maybe they're that this is why they're in the unsure category and maybe we could get some clarification on it tonight, but there's a lot sentence about um, if they choose um, uh, If they choose remote that somehow they will be missing some content. Uh, wait, here it is. The reality is that families who choose to stay remote will be missing a lot of content which could create learning gaps. Yes, so that was from the Q&A section, um, which was based on my last set of town hall meetings. And the, the reason for that is if you do a hybrid model where you're bringing 50% of the students in on a, on a given day, because of social distancing, you need 100% of the staff in order to accommodate 50% of the students. Um, so that means that I can't guarantee that there will be teachers who are able to engage students remotely. We can do things to support students remotely um, because everyone is going to be remote at least two days of the week and essentially three days when you throw in Wednesdays. Um, but that in-person content that people get in the hybrid model, I don't know whether or not we'll be able to replicate for, for our families who might choose to remain remote if we go in person, because I just don't know that it'll have the staff to do that. Okay, so um, I, will you have a clearer sense of this by next week, or is it going to just depend on the numbers who remain remote versus? It will. It will depend on the numbers who remain remote. If there's a substantial um, group of families that choose to remain remote, then we wouldn't necessarily need all of the teachers in person in order to support the, the, the students who are coming in person. Got it. Well, I'll be interested to see in the results of the survey because, and I'm sure this is true for the other members of the school committee, but while uh, tonight's public comment was overwhelmingly from parents in the direction of going 
hybrid. The emails that I've been receiving are possibly even split between staying remote and going hybrid. There's just no consensus among the emails that I've received. And I've received many, many, many more emails as I know other school committee members. So I get some sense that there will be a fair number of parents um, who, who want to keep their kids remote. So I, I don't know. I guess we'll see the survey results next week. Yes. More. Yeah, I, I mean, just to not leave that hanging, I can say you're exactly right. Um, overall, the results right now look pretty much like 40% in favor of going to hybrid, 40% in favor of remaining remote, and 20% uncertain. Um, when you break things up by by grade level or by by level of school, you may get a little bit more um, certainty. And when you break up by groups, you certainly get more certainty. Um, as I said, the the strongest signal that comes out of that is if you just look at students, um, students are definitely telling us that they'd like to come back. Okay, thank you. Member Levy. Thanks, a lot of my questions have already been asked, so I appreciate the, um, the remarks, Superintendent Provost, and also the questions from my colleagues. Um, I am confused. And I guess to me, one of the things that I would hope, I think towards what my colleagues have been already asking about is, is how we could be more proactive so that we are creating the model that works for our district and then figuring out how do we staff it? as opposed to figuring out what our staffing is and then making the model work. And I guess what I'm suggesting here is that when we talked about going hybrid, we always said that there would be the option for families to learn to remain remote. And if, if what we're saying now, and, and I appreciate that, that you shared that, that, that um, the Q and A from, from the town hall is about our uncertainty of how we would work with, with remote families. I think we need to create certainty that we're gonna be able to serve our, our families who are staying remote, and we're gonna be able to serve our, our families who are coming into the buildings. And perhaps that means we are, we are relying on our community members who have said, please let us help you. We would like to volunteer. We would like to be able to be a part of this effort to be able, I mean, I, I met with the Florence um, Association this week who said they have like 300 retired teachers who are part of their their community and they would love to be able to help. Perhaps there are ways that we can think more creatively about getting folks involved to help us with the remote learning so that people can stay remote and so that we are engaging our students when they're not in the buildings during those three days a week. I'm, I'm concerned that that we're not solidifying this this we're, we're it feels like we're waiting a long time to solidify the details of, of of this model i would love to see those details solidified and i'll echo member fallon's request that we be able to be pretty transparent and communicate those details so that it's not necessarily a, a, a series of town halls but even just something in writing here's what this is going to look like so that people can make those informed decisions um, so I guess in the end of this, I don't have a question because my questions have been answered, but simply a hope that that we could use and rely on our community members to help us and that we could create the model that works for our students and for our families and for our teachers and then figure out the staffing as we as we as we go, if that makes sense. Um, and that would mean I think starting now and not saying we need to wait until next week and there's a vote, but starting now so that we've got the, the, the gears in motion to be able to really implement and communicate transparently about that as soon as possible. Well, I, I, will, I will just say this in response to that. There is, there is a solution that technically is is feasible and I think would work. Um, it's a solution that I've talked with some other members of the committee about as well as administrators, which is allowing teachers to stream into the homes of, of students who are staying remote while they're teaching kids in class. Um, that I think is somewhat 
potentially controversial, but I do think that it would provide the best option in some ways I think would be easier from an instruction instructional point of view as well for the from the teachers perspective. Um, I know that other districts are addressing the remote challenge that way. Um, and if we could do that, then we could provide a lot more certainty um, around the this families who remain remote. Um, I do think that's something that, that probably would have to be a subject of impact bargaining. Yeah, I guess, again, my hope is that I, I hear you trying to find a way to make it work, and I really appreciate that. But my hope would be that we could instead say, here's the ideal model, not necessarily, well, how do we how do we make it work? But here's the ideal model and and then figure out staffing and what do we need to put in place. So if we think the best way for our students to learn is to stream, um, then let's let's pursue that. But if we don't think that's the best way for our students, students to learn or for our teachers to teach, let's figure out what is the best way for our students to learn and our teachers to teach and then pursue the staffing we need in order to, to make that work. Member Boss. Thank you. And I, um, I'll just say I agree with a lot of what's already been said, um, following up on Member Levy's comments. Um, one of the themes that came out of public comment and emails is just how can our community help? And I feel like I understand people running the, the business of the schools every day is so overwhelmed, but I do feel like we need to find a way to let the community help, whether it's PTOs figuring out how to put tents up not powered or heated tents, just tents. So there's places for kids to go outside. We know we're going to be living with COVID for a long time or other ways to take advantage of people wanting to help. We got it. We need to figure that out. Um, I also want to echo what I'm hearing in emails and from other districts watching what they're doing. I know everyone wants to get back, but I also, we also know that the kids that are struggling the most are the youngest kids. And if we don't have um, enough people to get everybody back at the same time, I would encourage us to focus on those youngest kids first and staging it and having a plan for our community to know what we're trying to do to get people back. I, I you know, I, I'm sure the high school families aren't going to be happy hearing me say this, that maybe they have to wait a few more weeks, but Zoom works better for older kids than for little kids. And I don't think there's on, on average, most of them. And I, I think we need to recognize that and get moving with it. And then really when I put my hand up was in response to member Gold's comment of what can we be doing now to get ready? And I wanted to add to that Dr. Provost and bring up one more topic and let maybe let you tell more of the story than me, but I feel like the issue of ventilation is huge and we are working hard on it and the community doesn't really know everything that we've discussed or talked about. And just very briefly to say that this um, is something we're all learning about. None of us are experts on it. We're trying to do the right things. And when I say that, I mean um, NACE, the school committee, the administrators, everyone. We wanna keep people well so that when we open schools we don't end up closing them right away and we don't get people sick so right now this week the cdc finally and i say finally because i think there's been a lot of good research around the world up till then has said it's airborne we know that we know masks are super important but so is ventilation and fortunately dr provost had contractors come in in the summer and measure air exchange rates per hour but interpreting those is something we are working on and we're working really hard on it. He's connected us with people in Cambridge. I actually think they're a really good model for bringing community members in to give expert advice. We've had community members offer us expert advice. I think we're making progress, but I want us to make progress by November 4th. And I don't, you know, I think we need to be honest and say we're working hard and I don't know where we are at that. I'll let, I'll let Dr. Provost say where he thinks we are at that. But um, there's huge differences across our schools. Some schools have better air exchange rates than others. Um, we ordered HEPA filters, which 
makes a difference in between keeping a room okay and not okay. And I don't know if they're in, but these things have all been going on in order to get ready to get people back. So with that, I, I mean, maybe Dr. Provost can say a little more about what's going on and give us a sense of how quickly it's moving. So, yes, um, and as you know, I'm, I'm not on the JLMC, but I get lots of reports from the JLMC from both you and Lisa and Andrea. Um, so there, there have been a number of um, consultants who've spoken to the group, including epidemiologists, including um, parts of the, the reopening committee in Cambridge. Um, I think one of the potential game-changing things um, could be for the, the JLMC to adopt the Cambridge rules around HEPA filters. Um, essentially what they have said is that a HEPA filter on high, I think is the equivalent of 2.7 air exchanges per hour, which um, is based on some, some research that's been done about the effectiveness of HEPA filtration. And if we could um, implement that in Northampton, then it would make many more of our spaces usable. Um, I also think that the, the, um, the current spacing is, is a constraint that we'd have to deal with. Um, right now, 50 square feet or 75 square feet per student is more than six foot social distancing. So none of the plans that um, I brought forward in the summer work with 50 feet or 75 feet social distancing. Um, so, uh, but hopefully having HEPA filtration in the building, um, in addition to the air exchange rates, which we have, which actually I will, I will say when I'm sharing my data with other districts, people are jealous of the amount of air exchanges that we have in numbers of our buildings. Um, we do have some places where it's not as good. Um, some of our older buildings don't have the same level of air exchanges, but I think the, the strategy has always been, um, what can you do to remediate? Um, if you go back to the, the first Harvard report on safe schools, um, they even talk about remediation strategies for schools that don't even have central, um, central HVAC systems, which is not our, our schools. All of our schools have univentilators. All of our schools have um, HVAC systems. So we're ahead of the game in a lot of ways. And I also just um, wanted to point out, just as a point of interest, because it, it had come up in public comment tonight, the air reports are um, public. They are on the district website. They're under the COVID-19 tab. It's called the Nexus Evaluation. It's the fourth link from the top on the district's COVID-19 tab. So anyone who wants to see those reports um, can go and access them at any time. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Um, Member Gold. I'm sorry, can I just do a quick follow-up? Um, sure. Dr. Provost and I have talked about this a lot, but I think it's, I, I'm just going to share my perspective and he can um, uh, say what he wants about it. But we have these numbers and the air exchange rate is the first step and it's really important. But you can imagine that knowing air exchange rate means how many times the air in the room turns over. And so things that really matter are how many kids are in the room. At this point, that matters almost as much in my mind, not as the distance. It's the number of kids, how many people are breathing into that space and what the, the area of the space is. A small room that turns over is different than a big room that turns over in terms of that. And there are people out, there's code that has to be followed. And my understanding is we don't yet have a report on how these different spaces meet the code. Um, and, and, you know, I, this is collaborative. We've been talking about this, but I'm trying to give people an idea of where we're at in the process and what still needs to happen. And I think we're getting to that point. But from my perspective, that's what we really need to see. So we know where to put those HEPA filters. We need to order the right ones. The 2.7 on high depends on how big the room is and what the filter's rated for and what we've ordered. So there's de the devil's in the details because we can't get the filters in. And if we could filter all our rooms and get an air exchange rate of five, the Harvard 
Um, the person who wrote the Harvard report, one of the authors came to the JLMC and he said, aim for five and go as low as four. That's what he said for air exchange, but it's different for different size rooms, for different occupancy rooms. And I feel like we need that professional expertise to come in, look at our numbers and give us some feedback. And the good news is the measurements are made. We're, we're getting there. And there's, you're right, we're in better shape than a lot of places and we need to get the pieces in place to make this work. And I just think it's important for the community to hear that. And if I said anything you disagree with Dr. Burbos, please share it. But I just want people to know where we're at in the process. Not to disagree, but just to add. Um, so under the original agreement, we had purchased TEPA filters for, um, or I should say the agreement that's in place now, we had purchased TEPA filters for rooms that fell within a certain number of air exchanges per hour. And in anticipation that this may be a helpful um, step for the district to take, I asked Tony to order HEPA filters for every classroom in the district. So um, we've already received the first shipment, which were for the designated rooms under remote, and we have um, a whole bunch more on the way for a potential move to hybrid. Member Gold. Thanks. A um, couple points, and thank you for the time. Um, I think it's important for the school committee and also the public to really grasp the idea that in order for superintendent provost and his team and the teachers to actually effectively plan for remote and hybrid, a remote model where there would be, sorry, a hybrid model where there still would be remote, they need the direction from us, right? Like we can't, ex we can't expect them to be proactive. Um, back in August, nine out of 10 of us, and I was the only one to vote to say go to go hybrid, said to go remote. The cards were stacked against him and against the district. And for them to, for us to have think that they would spend the month of September planning hybrid when we were so far away from even considering hybrid is kind of unfair. Like it's not, I, it, there, it, I don't want anyone to think that the district has dropped the ball on moving to hybrid um, or considering it. There is only so much capacity they have. And it, clearly we were far away from it. Um, I want to make clear that back in September, I requested that it get on the agenda for September to consider a move to hybrid and the agenda setting committee rejected that. Okay, so it's really like this, this was trying to be tried to start this earlier too. So the proactivity, we can't really ask them to be proactive until there is the understanding that we're going to go the hybrid and um, or some other model. Um, I also think it's important to know that we don't have to solve everything to give them the direction to start moving to hybrid, right? Like we don't have to figure out all the air things and all of these things to say, start planning for hybrid. We, if, if we said we're gonna move to hybrid and it happened and our goal was November 4th, and for some reason the district said we needed an additional week, at least we knew that the public would be able to accept that because okay, we understand you're working towards that. You needed a little bit more time. But if come November, October, next Thursday, if we're not prepared to tell the district, okay, we're able to move to hybrid, then they're not gonna, we, I don't want them to invest that time. I want them to invest their time to figure out remote. I mean, un, unfortunately, right? Like we've got to give them the, give the district the confidence that the school committee supports them on that. And so I think that's really important to understand. Another piece is, um, there is plenty of examples statewide now of hybrid plans that have been in place that in, uh, provide remote as well. If we give them the approval, we're not going to have to write the script ourselves. We're not going to have to reinvent the wheel. He's going to be able to go and the district's going to be able to go and look at the, how they're making it all work. It's not going to be as challenging. But the first step is to say, you have the go ahead to start planning for an alternate model. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we need to really understand how critical that, because even one week is a whole lot of time. If it takes four weeks to plan something, one week's 25% of that. So like a week's time, us waiting another week, we try, tried really hard to get the vote today, but we weren't able to do that either. Um, we can't keep pushing this down the line. It's really unfair to do that and put the pressure on the district that way and our teachers and our community. We can't keep pushing it down the line. Um, I think it's important um, and you know, and member Voss, you're a really strong proponent of all of this ACH numbers and all of this and, and making sure the health things are right. but we just got 17 MOAs sent to us from, um, from districts throughout the, throughout the state, and only four of them had any mention of HVAC or ACH. You search, I did a, 
I searched for ACH, I searched for HVAC, there was and maybe four of those 17 that we got that mentioned that. So I, I, I worry that when you say the devil's in the details, we're trying to say, we're not gonna move until all those details are fixed and all those details are finished. And um, that's holding up a whole lot because had we been able to do this in September, he could have had two months to solve all of this. And I'll be honest, I'm a little bit uncomfortable and maybe there's something in the school committee, I don't know if we have to talk about this in executive session, I'm uncomfortable and again, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm a public school teacher in the same union as NACE, it's not a, against the teachers thing, but I'm uncomfortable entering a negotiation that before we actually say we're gonna move to anything. Like, I, like I, it's, a, it's a struggle to think on Wednesday, we're gonna sit down with NACE and discuss what might we need. And we don't even know if the 10 of us support it, right? Like we need to have the weight of the school committee on the side of whatever it is that we're doing when we meet on Wednesday. And that's why I thought it was critical that we have this vote tonight, or at least share some opinions and what we're feeling with this but if we leave it open-ended, then Wednesday becomes hard. It becomes hard for NACE because they don't understand what the school committee wants. It becomes hard for the negotiation that it doesn't. And for all we know, uh, it hopefully would go well, but what if it went bad? And then Thursday's meeting happened. So I don't even know, you know, maybe that's something for executive uh, later on, but um, I just really think that it's important for the 10 of us to say something tonight about where we're standing so that we at least give the public an idea of what they can start to think and wrap their heads around and expect. I know we're not voting on it tonight because it's not a vote ordered in there, even though we tried hard to make it happen. Um, we need to, each, each of the 10 of us needs to start to say where we're at personally. Member Kaufman. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think I just need to remind my, my colleague, uh, Member Gold, that each of the nine, each of the 10 of us stated where they are not, where we are not that long ago. And um, the fact that you got outvoted nine to one doesn't give you the right to now jeopardize the agreement that we made with NACE to question the decisions where we made. Uh, we made a decision and you have to live with it, Member Gold. Um, we now have an opportunity next week. Um, and what I'm looking forward to doing is uh, hearing from the JLMC. Um, my, my idea and my hope is that the JLMC will give us some guidance on what we need to do uh, to move to the next phase. And if we could um, meet those things, I would be extremely anxious and excited to work with um, administration and everybody else to come up with a plan. I do need to remind um, Member Gold that we have a plan, that we spent uh, many, many hours over the summer agreeing or discussing uh, many ideas, I don't know, maybe as many as 10 or 15 different modes that um, Superintendent Provost had given to us. Some were, like you said, some were just beginning at elementary um, and not secondary. There was a big push about that, that it wouldn't be fair. There was so many, you, you guys remember, I mean, there's so many plans and whether we chose the right one or not is, is um, certainly I'm open to discussing whether we need to move back and reconsider that. I and mean, obviously we've learned a lot in the three weeks of school, but um, the idea that we're going to move completely into another area or to come up with people to help or we be, need to begin to do things. Um, the part of me that does agree with Member Gold is that it's, it's, um, it hasn't been very long. We have folks like Dr. Provost and the various school administrators that are on this call working probably 20 hours a day. Uh, we cannot wave a magic wand if we wanted to and say, why don't we do more of this and more of that? We obviously, based on the preliminary information that Dr. Provost gave, we have a split community. And if we select to go to remaining in remote, we're going to alienate a bunch of folks. If we go fully in person, which I don't think we can, or if we go to remote, we're gonna alienate some other folks where we've been put in a completely impossible situation. So um, I don't like being called out for decisions that nine out of 10 of us reached member goal. Um, obviously it's free speech, but that wasn't too settling for me to hear, um, particularly for your reasons for constantly uh, asking us to do something illegal and vote on something which is against the agreement that we reached. So um, shame on you. Shame on you for asking us to do that and shame on you for making yourself sound like you're better than us and you have an opportunity for us to ignore your um, 
I guess I would say, sole, just sole uh, opposing view that the rest of us agreed on. I'm not saying it was a great choice or not, but you really need to let it go. Um, finally, I just want to call on Dr. Provost and the rest of the administrators for an unbelievable job that you guys are doing. Uh, we didn't ask for the virus. We're getting very limited help from the federal government. We're getting very little help from the state government. We're getting very little money. We're dealing with day-to-day -day crisis situations. The teachers are doing the best they can in a brand new environment. And um, I just, hats off to all of you, hats off to all the staff, hats off to the, the people that are doing all they can. And um, to constantly blame and look for fault is basically, I've had enough. I mean, people are just really frustrated, I get it, but um, we can't do anything. We can't wave a magic wand and solve this. You, everybody is aware of the, of the situation that we're in. Everybody know, knows who's let us down. Everybody knows this is the first time we've been through this. Um, everybody's going to make mistakes. Um, and for people to, I don't even want to get into it, but I mean, please, relax. We're going to get through this. It's been three weeks. We're going to do the best we can. We have other jobs. We have other lives to live. We're all um, doing the best we can. So um, it's not the time to start criticizing people, Ronnie. Not at all. Mayor Narquitz, if I could respond, because I got called out a couple times there. Um, a number of times, yes. And, and yes, by the way, you can. I, Mayor Narquitz, and you shouldn't have let it go. We we're, we're only wanted to hear something from Dr. Provost on movement. And you let, you let this thing go where it, where it didn't need to go. So I would encourage you to pull us back in, please, because. Um, okay, well, I, I would actually like to get the meeting. I would like us to move away from what was just a report um, from the superintendent. Um, and so uh, in, I do feel, Member Gold, if you want to respond, uh, please keep it brief and try to just um, the spirit of comedy here and not, uh, I just don't want to see us, um, you know, going back and forth, but I, I just, yeah. So very brief. Um, okay, so I'm a little confused because I did ask if this was on the agenda, would we be allowed to discuss it? And I was told that we could. So that was a miscommunication then because I asked well, if there, this item there, was on there. Is a, there was definitely a discussion about what the transition elements would involve, but we couldn't actually take up the actual question of, of moving, um, you know, moving to remote because of the fact that we had an MOA that said we had this October 15th date. So that's why we were not able to actually deliberate on the move or, you know, to, to hybrid until the 15th. So, well, but, so, and that's the point that I wanted because member Kaufman was saying that I was asking us to do something illegal. Um, member Seraphie Cox or member Foss, who's on that team, unless I'm misunderstanding it, they had until October 15th, not that, you know, add by, they, the language was by October 15th. So they could have given that to us at the end of September for all, if they were, if they were ready to. The JLMC had a window. And, and we did, we did ask them, prior, the agenda setting team, and I did it quite publicly, I copied the school committee members, will you be able to get it to us by the 8th? And they right. said they were not able to. So, right. well, um, so that's, that's why we weren't able to have it on this agenda. But I, I guess I want us to, we, we do have, of many more items on this agenda to get to, including an executive session, and it's now 1040. So I would like to move us forward unless there's any other, any other discussion about what the superintendent has laid out. Um, okay, well then there's one last thing I did want to bring up um, and I'll not respond to member uh, Hoffman. Um, member, uh, Superintendent Provost, um, it sounds like we can approve a move to hybrid and then in the time you can work with your team and the teachers to develop what that hybrid plan looks like because you gave us a lot of different hybrid plans and now we have examples statewide of different hybrid plans so it isn't necessarily that it has to be exactly as we sent to the state you could change it unless i'm mistaken to elementary first or all these other scenarios that we had as long as you first get the go ahead start figuring out how to get us to hybrid is that correct well, we have hybrid models that have been submitted to the state and approved by school committee for both elementary, middle, and high school. We um, have also negotiated language that agrees with those models. Um, so I think the models um, are set. What we could have some flexibility around is how we phase them in. Um, the way the state sets it up, 
there are essentially um, three three switches with three positions. You have elementary, middle, and high. Each one of those can be remote, hybrid, or in person. Um, so that's why I think of it. I think of it as nine possible situations that the district could be in. When the, the school committee votes for hybrid, they could vote hybrid elementary, middle, and high. They could vote hybrid just elementary. They could vote potentially just certain grades. Um, but when that happens, then we would be implementing the model that we've already submitted to the state that aligns with the language that's already been negotiated by the negotiating subcommittee. But if we're saying only specific grades, it sounds like now you're amending the hybrid plan, like kind of like what we saw in Amherst where they said this grades and this, I mean, we can change what we sent to the state, right? Like, I would, I, would, I would say that that's not really an amendment. It's just saying that we're, we're going to be in different phases at different levels at the same time. So for example, you could be, you could be hybrid elementary and remote middle and high. And then you could switch to hybrid elementary and middle and remote high school. I'm not saying that's what to do, but that those are potential models. They're already built into the plan that we have, and they're already aligned with the language that's been negotiated. Okay. I mean, yeah, maybe potentially a semantical thing, but I, I hear what you're saying. I, I hear it. Okay. Um, so why don't we um, conclude this portion of the agenda. Thank you, Dr. Provost, for your presentation. And um, let's go back now. We've completed uh, section seven of the agenda. Let's now move back to where we left off in section five. Um, and we were receiving reports and recommendations from the school committee. And we were anticipating a report from member Fallon on the collaborative for educational services. All right, thank you. Uh, you should all receive the 20 page executive director's report from the collaborative um, via email today. Um, but as M Massachusetts general law requires me to report on our activities at least five times a year, I'm going to share just a few highlights um, from our last meeting with you. Um, our reorganization meeting was last week. Uh, thankfully, Dan Hayes of the Shutesbury School Committee was willing to continue in his role as chair. Um, and was reelected by the representatives of the 37 school committee members belonging to the collaborative um, to serve another year's term leading the board of directors. Um, I was elected vice chair, so I hope you'll leave, you'll join me in wishing Dan good health and good luck as he leads the collaborative during a period of transition and uncertainty because I have zero desire to ever have to take that role over. It's a huge responsibility. Um, as you may recall, Bill Deal, the executive director of the collaborative, um, has announced that he'll be retiring December 31st of this year. We had initially hoped to hire someone to begin um, on January 1st, um, but for a variety of reasons, we, uh, the board has agreed to adjust our timeline and move the new executive director's start date until um, July 1st, 2021. So Karen Ruder, our current deputy director, has agreed to serve as interim executive director uh, beginning in January until a candidate is hired and begins. Um, we'll start the candidate screening process in December um, and in and January, and then we'll hold interviews in February and have our interview committee, which um, I'm also serving on, um, make recommendations regarding finalists to move forward with um, either virtual or um, in-person site visits. Um, our goal is to bring the final candidate to a board meeting in April or May and then extend an offer uh, by June to the finalist who would ideally accept and join the collaborative as a executive director um, on July 1st. Um, the Board of Directors, we were responsible for voting on reopening plans for both Mount Tom Academy and Heck Academy, um, in addition to voting on opening, uh, reopening plans for our own districts. Um, the decision was made for both programs to open in a hybrid mode. Um, Northampton currently has four students enrolled um, this year at um, Heck Academy. Remote learning began on September 15th. Um, Things went fairly well overall, but unfortunately we ran into all the same problems at Heck Academy that we have um, in our district. Um, 
there were issues with Chromebooks. There were issues with bandwidth. Um, our Chromebook, uh, new Chromebooks were delayed. There were supply chain issues. So they hopefully will be here by the end of October, the early, um, early November. Um, and then while we had initially planned for um, the first cohort of six students to begin in-person learning um, Monday, September 28th, we had to delay it because we, our school nurse um, left the district, left um, and we have been unable to fill the position. Um, to provide in-person services, you're required by law to have a school nurse. Um, apparently there is a shortage of school nurses right now. So we're still trying to fill that position. Um, Northampton also has one student currently enrolled in Mount Tom Academy, which is, as you know, a, um, an alternative high school program. We were previously running out, out of um, Holyoke Community College. Uh, that space is not available to us currently. And so the decision was made to open under a hybrid model with two cohorts at the location um, at, on Holly Street in Northampton. Um, unfortunately, we've had to delay in-person learning there uh, for the same reason that we don't have a school nurse. Um, and then uh, Northampton once again joined the consortium, uh, the, the 23 districts that are the Title III consortium. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of that. So the Title III consortium is, uh, it supports English language learners. Um, and it allows districts whose individual enrollment is lower than 100 English language learners. Um, they would in ordinarily be um, ineligible for Title III funds. And so by joining with the collaborative, we are eligible. Um, this SS subgrant provides funds um, to districts um, to support direct services to students, family engagement, and professional development for teachers and administrators. Uh, we made a request for $141,000, um, but the award decision is still pending. Um, and just a couple more things. Uh, it's been a couple months since I've reported. Districts are receiving um, $225 per student through the CARES Act uh, for personal protection equipment expenses, um, but collaboratives were ineligible for additional state aid. And so the recommendation from DESE was that funding should follow the student. Um, the board voted to bill districts that $225 as a separate invoice for students enrolled in the collaborative academies. Um, although the collaborative was ineligible for state aid through the CARES Act, they are eligible to apply as regional districts. Um, independent for municipalities for a FEMA program that might cover some costs of PPE and COVID related expenses. Um, I, I don't know if you all recall, but this is important because we did finish um, the, the fiscal year 2020 at a $350,000 deficit. Um, so any effort to recover our losses would be really great. Um, and then finally, uh, we are, I participated in a strategic planning retreat led by the consulting group Strategy Matters last month. The collaborative is in the process of um, a multi-year strategic plan. Our st strategic plan for the collaborative ended in 2020. And so we've enlisted um, a consulting group to include a diverse range of stakeholders in developing a new multi-year strategic plan that aligns with the collaborative's vision, mission, and social justice and equity values with the hopes to complete it and share it with you all by next spring. So that is it in a nutshell, the last three months of activities for the collaborative. And I won't be reporting to you again, hopefully until January. Thank you very much, Member Fallon. Is there any, are there any questions about the Collaborative for Educational Services. Okay, seeing none, let's move to um, Member Condon. Is there any update from the Superintendent Evaluation Committee since our last report? Uh, no new updates from our subcommittee now. Okay, thank you very much. Member Busansky, is there an update from the Budget and Property Committee? Yes, there is. I'm gonna turn off my video because see if I can get a better connectivity. Uh, so yes, we, uh, Budget and Property Committee, um, as you know, we are bumping up against the motion that we approved back in the winter 
which seems oh so long ago to come up with a to present a couple of late start plans and have you vote on it before the end of this calendar year and i am to say that we are on track with that luckily um and a big thank you goes to tammy lieber and to cammy for really um coming up with a number of plans and um working it through with us and we got through a lot of it really mostly we finished the work in june so we do have two plans to present you with at the next in the november meeting so i imagine that's the november 12th meeting um, where the bus costs are neutral. It's cost neutral in terms of bus costs, which is great news. And then um, we'll have a month long period for community feedback um, from all the stakeholder groups. And then with the hope that we would vote on it in the December 10th meeting. So budget and properties next meeting is on October 21st. So we'll just shore everything up. Um, in that meeting and then um, we'll have we'll invite Tammy Lieber to come and along with us um, present to you those uh, the two plans for the community with the hope of uh, moving to late a later start for the high school um, uh, in September of 2021 so right yes that's all okay thank you very much uh, thank you to you and your committee um, next we have the school business administrators report and the personnel report from Kemi Lamica Sure. Um, so in your packet, I included the business report, including the financial report of where we are through October 2nd in this fiscal year. Um, I am working with the budget and property subcommittee. Um, I'm going through each line. They've actually asked me to go through and make a prediction of and an estimate of where we are, shortfalls, um, and where we plan to be. Um, so I'm working through each line of the budget to pre prepare an estimate of those needs to forecast any known or potential shortfalls um, we may have during the fiscal year. Um, and I will provide that to the Budget and Property Committee within the next month, and then we will be bringing it up for discussion and review at a upcoming school committee meeting. Um, and for the personnel report, I have um, nine new hires, five separations, and three transfers uh, during the month of September. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Kim, are there any questions about either of those two reports from school committee members? Okay, then let's move to the superintendent's report. Dr. Provost. Great, thanks very much. Uh, I have some breaking news that I'll start the report with, which has to do with the issue of athletics. Um, unfortunately, it looks like our athletic director has left the meeting, perhaps. Um, but what what you saw at the beginning of the meeting is a sort of classic case of contract interpretation. Um, so the I wanted to explain what happened here regarding athletics and why um, we had a, a report from Andrea Gito that was different from um, my my implementation of the contract. So everything comes down to section 13D, which has two sections, which use different language. In section 13D2, it says, if average daily cases or the rate in any town contiguous to Northampton not previously listed as well as Amherst is eight or more cases red, or if the average daily case rate is four to seven cases per 100,000 yellow in Northampton, East Hampton, or Holyoke, the JLMC will meet within 24 hours to determine whether or not in-person learning will be paused. That is sort of the lower level threshold. That is when you have communities in yellow, it doesn't trigger an automatic pause and it specifically references in-person learning. There's another section, section one, which says if the average daily rate in Northampton, East Hampton, Holyoke is eight cases or more per 100,000 red, all in-person services will pause immediately. The GLMC will meet within 48 hours to consider a situation and make a recommendation for the process and timing of resuming in-person services. So um, just want you to know that I am in very close communication with Andrea um, all throughout this process. We spoke at five o'clock last night. We emailed at 
seven or eight o'clock last night. Um, we spoke again this afternoon and then have been communicating via text during the meeting on a potential solution to the problem um, based on the statement that she made earlier in the, in the meeting. So my proposal would be to use the language from section 13 D2 in section 13 D1 as well. So 13 D1 would not reflect a um, cessation of all in-person services as it currently says, but only in-person learning as is reflected in section two. And Andrea has let me know that she would be amenable to that change. So um, unless anyone from, well, I guess I can't say anyone, unless the chair or vice chair of the school committee directly otherwise, what I can do is have Layla draft a memorandum to Jason saying we'd like to make this change. Both um, my, my sense is that the school committee would be amenable to that. And I know that NACE would be amenable to that so we can um, resume that issue. Based on Andrea's representations, I'm quite certain that there won't be grievances filed if we resume athletics while we're trying to get this worked out. So um, I will reach out to the athletic director um, on that front. So now the, the next piece of my report is just how opening went. Um, and I asked the principals of the schools to just provide a brief reflection on the remote opening at their school. It, this is unedited, as you will see. The only piece that I added where um, it's relevant is what the current wait list is. Um, because under the current agreement and the current ACH mostly, but also in some cases staffing shortages as well, we're not able to um, serve all the students who are eligible for services under the the remote model. Um, so I'll be re reporting that as well. So Ryan Road opening has, they have a wait list of five and Principal Madden says, John Provost asked me to provide some information and reflection about how things have been going at the start of school. At Ryan Road, I'm blessed with a remarkably committed staff. Our team has done well connecting with families, creating schedules, communicating and collaborating with one another, meeting with me and thinking outside the box, even when we're forced to teach inside one, about how to keep students engaged in a learning format that none of us think is a healthy way to teach. They have embraced the challenge and continue to learn new technology tips and find ways to support a variety of learners that appear on their computer screens every morning. We all feel pretty tired but we're also strong and persevere together. The start of the school year was especially difficult for me because of not knowing what was actually going to happen until well into September. In many ways, I was unable to lead staff or communicate with families in a timely manner. It was unfair and disrespectful to families to have the approach of school start with so little information. My greatest frustration is the restriction around air exchanges and the number of people allowed in rooms. We have a great deal of wasted space here at Ryan Road. We're providing just the bare minimum special education services with a mix of remote and in-person. Many parents wish their children could spend more time at the school and these children need the additional time and support from teachers and staff. However, because of room restrictions, we cannot have more students in our building for any increased time. It's heartbreaking to have students and caregivers begging for more support. And my answer is that they have, and my answer has to remain negative. Children who are coming to our schools, so happy to be here, are working hard. This has been the highlight of September. We've had many technology difficulties, but that was not expected during remote learning. Our IT team has been working hard to figure out systems of support, but even so, my incredible secretary spent an enormous amount of time throughout the day on the phone with frustrated parents who feel helpless and unable to connect. We're lucky here at Ryan Road that most teachers and many ESPs are choosing to work in the building. This has allowed us to keep our strong community and closeness, even with distancing. This helps us problem solve the new issues that arise in our remote world. Teachers receive numerous emails every day about difficulties caregivers are having trying to work with their children at home. Having teachers here makes the pick up and drop off work and learning materials run more smoothly too. One recent day, we had two Spanish speaking mothers who were sisters outside the cafeteria doors with a Chromebook on a cart just inside the door. They were getting a lesson on how to have their children connect and with online learning. The EL teacher, two classroom teachers, and our Spanish speaking custodian while all working together to help with this important project certainly takes a village. 
Bridge Street opening from Beth Chiquette, where the wait list is seven. At Bridge Street, for the most part, things have gone well from my perspective. Although there aren't a lot of students here in the building, it's brought me much joy to walk through to see them walk through the doors on the first day. Hearing their voices in the hall almost makes me feel like it's normal again. I've been so impressed by my staff, the time they took to connect with families, build relationships, and make sure everyone is okay is truly amazing. The challenges have been mostly about teachers being overwhelmed, technology, and coverage. Many of our teachers are putting in 10 plus hours a day and are exhausted and are on the brink of burnout already. I'm extremely worried about their health and well-being. Part of the burnout is due to the lack of technology working for students and them, connectivity issues both in school and at home, and the fact that we're learning a whole new way to teach. We need to make sure they are okay and feel supported. Technology has been the biggest issue in the building. Principals have been managing it with the help of office staff. It's not our wheelhouse, so it's difficult to talk tech with families when we are often unsure of some of it ourselves. If we had it all to do over again, I would recommend that the start of the year would have had a dedicated IP, IT person in each of our buildings for the first week or two to handle all the technology issues. We do this for MCAS testing. It would have made things run more smoothly if we had thought of that. Due to a lot of staff working at home, there's no coverage in the building when people are out. Remember, a lot of students in the building have significant needs with one-to-one, -one, special training in specific programs, toileting, etc. There are also no subs available to work in person, and they shared with Rebecca that they're scared to death to do, to do remote. By not allowing students to work remotely from home, if their teacher ESP out is out, it puts us in an unsafe situation where students may not have coverage. Finally, I'm deeply concerned that the district, that while the district is focused on race equity and training, our staff on alternatives to discipline such as restorative practices, we're okay with excluding our staff who are working with students five full days a week in person. Most districts have either a half day midweek or a completely day off in the midweek. I'm finding it hard to understand why we can't offer four and a half days during hybrid remote for our most vulnerable students. It's unfair to the staff um, to not be able to be part of any of the collaboration or PD being given. They are probably the people who could use it most of all given the population of students they work with. If we are providing equal opportunities for staff to better themselves and their craft, shouldn't it be for all staff? Before I sign off, I received nothing but positive comments from families, although many of them are struggling with technology. They've all been very appreciative of the work we're doing and have nothing but good things to say about our teachers. So even though we have challenges, I think for the most part, at least at BSS, families are happy and understand the difficulties of all this. Leads from Chris Wenz, where the wait list is eight. As you are currently aware, the school has been like no other for everyone involved, including the opening of schools. It was difficult to communicate with educators, caregivers, and families through the negotiation process. Having the final decision voted on just before we were to open was very draining and stressful on many people. However, working in teams throughout the summer and meeting daily to discuss the opening of school gave us the direction and support we needed. The gift the state gave us to have educators receive training for the first 10 days of schools was a tremendous boost to assist many educators with technology and programs they were about to begin. Many staff members commented on the quality of offerings of the technology trainings they were provided. Additionally, providing educators time to meet with caregivers and students, whether in person or on Zoom, just before school, was a tremendous help in building relationships with family and students. One of the difficulties I had was finding qualified long-term substitutes for two positions at Leeds, as well as an ESP who was willing to work in person. So our two long-term subs did not receive the training that the other teachers did. We're still in the process of hiring one ESP for Leeds as the one we did hire resigned three days into the school year. We are having difficulty getting supplies for students who need at home. However, the business office worked hard with Dr. Cheevers and administrators to fill our requisitions and requests. Having remote learning time and students in person is like trying to run two schools at the same time. The facilities department worked very hard to secure what we needed for signs, cleaning, supplies, materials um, that were needed for to open in person. The air exchange metrics have limited the space we have available for learning. We've had to move uh, a kindergarten classroom two times due to COVID, uh, to CO2 levels and spacing issues. 
We have waiting lists for students to be in person. Our special education teachers are working like a classroom teacher, and this is very different for them. The pandemic response team has been a huge resource and available for any questions and our concerns to our families and staff. They've trained everyone for PPE use and continue to do so on a daily basis. One major struggle was the rollout of Chromebooks for elementary students. We did not have enough Chromebooks to distribute at the time of rollout. However, the IT department, office staff, and administrators worked very hard to find Chromebooks so everyone could start learning when the remote plan actually began. We continue to have families struggling with internet connections and lag time while students are trying to learn. Rocky and Molly have been um, quick with assistance when needed. We have a system in place that is working for caregivers who need assistance. At Jackson Street from Laura Brown, where the wait list, Lauren Brown rather, where the wait list is six. Because of our dedicated collaborative team, Jackson Street is up and running well. The students in this building are getting what they need thanks to our hardworking ESPs, special educators and service providers. Custodians, nurse and cafeteria workers are keeping us safe and fed and our clerical team is making sure we're organized. All teachers are working their tails off to deliver impactful remote instruction to their students. Despite the constraints, the JSS team is making school happen. On the first day of school, a student showed up at the doors of Jackson Street. He had his backpack on. He was ready to learn. We weren't open for students yet though, so we sat together at the threshold and I helped him log into his morning meeting. In a matter of minutes, he was happily saying good morning to his classmates. The safe familial feeling that the students and teachers cultivate was already growing. A few minutes later, the students teacher toasted, uh, students teacher posted a picture of a plate holding a piece of toast. The toast had peanut butter and blueberries on it. The blueberries were arranged in a three by four rectangle and there was a knife next to the plate. The teacher asked how many. The first student the teacher called on excitedly said 12. The teacher asked the student what made them think there were 12 blueberries and the student explained. The teacher did not do anything to suggest that the student was right or wrong. They just asked questions to help the student share their thinking. Then the teacher asked, does, this, does anyone have a different answer? There was a long pause. One student said, one, I see only one piece of toast. The teacher didn't say anything else. The students knew exactly what door had just been opened. Two, I see one piece of toast and one paper plate. 16, there's one plate, one piece of bread, a blob of peanut butter, 12 blueberries and a knife. Three, there's a plate, a piece of toast and a knife. What this teacher and the students had established in the first 30 minutes of their remote meeting was incredible. Teacher launched a rigorous mathematical community using a visual model which allowed all students to access. The three by four rectangle, or the array as we call it, is one of the most powerful math mathematical models we use to support, explore, and communicate about multiplication and division. By omitting equations and numbers, in this most vulnerable of moments, the teacher invited all students into a safe mathematical space with minimal anxiety because the conversation was really just about toast and blueberries. The teacher in the class have established that there are multiple ways of seeing things, even in math class. They established that all voices are valuable, that creative out of the box thinking is not only valuable and necessary, but that's what creates part of joy in the classroom. The differentiation the teacher provided is a clear example of best practice. They made sense for all students to be able to answer this open-ended question in a way that made sense of them. Because the teacher's expert presentation in this open-ended question and their choice did not validate or invalidate student responses, students could answer in a way that was appropriate to them. When the open-ended activity made space for students to say there was one piece of toast, there were 12 blueberries, the students grapple with differences between the three groups of four blueberries and the four groups of three blueberries. It was simply beautiful. More importantly, the teacher used this activity and message for students that all voices and perspectives have value in their shared space. Together, teacher and their students set the foundation for a community where all feel safe and are there to learn. And they did it over Zoom within the first 30 minutes of the day. While the challenges and constraints of remote learning are real for all, connections forged between teachers and students are strong, and those connections form the basis on which learning happens. Wherever you look at Jackson Street, whether in person or remote, that's what you find. Teachers and students are co-creating classroom communities where all members feel a sense of belonging and significance, and therefore, robust learning of all kinds can take place. JFK from Desmond Caldwell, there's no wait list there. School year is off to a strong start. Our in-person student attendance is steadily growing. Students and families are trusting us to keep them safe and in-person staff seem to be building great relationships with students. Our remote learning has also gotten off to a great start. Attendance is up. 
Students who struggled in the spring are doing much better. The technical issues are decreasing daily. Thus far, communications from parents have been overwhelmingly positive. They have been very complimentary of the hard work our teachers have put in and are very pleased by how engaged the students have been. The positive start has allowed us to move more easily and quickly to deal with a few negative moments we have encountered. Still, we have room for improvement and strive to get better each day. But in a world where everyone has really worried about all that is, could have gone wrong, we have been pleased about our opening. And then finally, the high school from Lori Valancourt, where the wait list is three. 59 students have been participating in remote learning in the building. These students come to student and log in to their online class. Students are grouped into seven classrooms supervised by one ESP. Strengths. All students in the building have access to Wi-Fi. All students are provided a, a free lunch. Students are able to socially engage with peer. For those who need transportation, it's working. We have one counselor available to support the students in the building. Access to counseling service is a huge strength. The 8 to 2.30 day has been appreciated by students and faculty. Clubs are running. Sports are running. Collaboration time is beneficial and have, are having success in completion completing assessments, curriculum, and standards alignment. Students report appreciating all their work being assigned at the start of the week and having Wednesday as a work day to catch up on their assignments. Struggles. I do not have teachers to work with students in the building. ESPs cannot offer the same support to students in class. The demand is too high for one ESP to manage. ESPs are not able to support all the students in their classes. These students have IEPs and are in different online classes in different grade levels, working with different teachers. It's impossible to meet the needs of these students. Students at home are not using ESP support during remote learning, leaving some ESPs without any workload. It would be helpful to have one teacher matched with one ESP to support students working in the building. Students are Unable to participate in physical activities required in their wellness PE classes due to lack of supervision and space. Most students in the building will not participate in conversations or breakout rooms in their online class. This is because they don't want teachers and peers to see that they are in the building. They are masked and in classroom spaces with peers. Teachers are reporting fatigue from the hours of synchronous class time. ELL students and special ed students are falling behind. There's an increase in absences and lack of attendance. I have four substitute teachers in the building offering daily breaks and lunch coverage to in-building staff. This is expensive and not sustainable. Sometimes they do not show up. Although they're working very hard, their training is limited. We can only put 12 students on a bus for sporting events. This is a problem with transportation getting students to games. Everyone has worked so hard to get everyone remote or in person up and running. We are still working out the kinks for both modes of learning. And all the rest that I had to share was either in my report about reopening or um, my news flash about a potential resolution to the sports issue. So that's, that's my report for this month. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Um, Member Goldman, your hand is up. Was that from before or was this related to the report? Um, it's related to move to suspend the rules. Go ahead. I'd like to move to suspend the rules. Um, I can't, I couldn't hear you, I can't. I move to suspend the rules. Okay, uh, there's I'll a motion to, that. yeah, there's a motion to suspend rules because we're past 11. Um, um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on that. Thank you, Member Goldman. Member Gold. No. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busanski. Yes. Uh, Member Fallon. No. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. No. Member Levy. Ask a question. Does no? I can't ask a question. A clarifying no. question. No. Um, no. Not really. Not, not during a vote. vote. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. 
Yes. And Member Voss. No. The vote is six in favor, four against. Okay, so um, we will continue the meeting. Um, we have one item of old, uh, we have two items on the old, of old business. Um, the first is the appointment of a voting delegate and alternate to the MASC Delegate Assembly. This is obviously something we talked about earlier in the meeting, um, uh, how we would instruct said delegate to vote. And so I guess I would ask if there's anyone on the community that is interested in serving as either a voting delegate or an alternate to the delegate assembly. Or would somebody like to nominate someone? Hmm. Okay, a hush fell over the crowd. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, would the um, committee like me to appoint someone to be the delegate as the chair? Or, I mean, I can certainly do that or I can certainly um, uh, make yeah, a suggestion. Do you, a, do you need a motion for that? Not really, I mean, I, I mean again, um, uh, you know, I would, I, would, uh, I would entertain a motion to ask member Fallon to continue in that role. <laughs> Are you sure nobody wants to take advantage of this fabulous opportunity to spend a Saturday afternoon doing the delegate assembly remotely? I, I'm going to be there anyway. I have to be, but like this is a great chance for you to get involved. You really have no interest, no? Are we required no? to have somebody there? Are we required? No, but don't you want to have a vote, Member Gold? Um, I mean, I'm just wondering if he has to appoint someone is all. If no one wants to do it, does he have to appoint someone? That's honestly all I meant. Well, if, if no one wants to do it, I'll do it, because we're not going to disenfranchise ourselves in that fashion. And you are, you'll be attending anyway in your new role as vice president, correct? No, that's that's the collaborative. No, I'm division oh, chair and we're supposed to be there. So, OK, so you're going to be there anyway. So I think it would make perfect sense to have you represent us. I would ask unanimous consent that um, member member Fallon represent us at the I know we can't do that, but um, I would be comfortable having you uh, do that again um, since you'll be uh, there in, in a different capacity. Are there any objections to that? Okay, so it is, it is hereby decreed. So thank you, Member Fallon, and, um, and you can uh, report back to us on how that turns out. Of course. Okay, um, let me now turn to Member Kaufman, who's going to do a discussion on the retreat. Um, Member Kaufman. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I'm, I'll make this super quick. So um, let me, so we have a uh, we have a meeting coming up on October 22nd just and as a reminder that's not a that's not a regular school committee meeting or a retreat in fact that's our one of our regular quarterly student success meetings that was the one that we agreed would replace the one that um, was rescheduled in um, from September and that was an opportunity to hear and discuss and approve the six different school improvement plans which is actually a, a responsibility that the um, school committee needs to do. So I would ask Dr. Provost, um, do you know yet whether schools will have that ready, do you think? Yes, they will. I've seen drafts of most schools, school improvement plans. Okay, so do you think um, we can go ahead with that for the 22nd? Yes. Okay, so I was gonna say we can have a retreat if that isn't ready, so we'll have that. Um, so fall is typically a time that the school committee has a retreat or considers a retreat and I, you know, for my, what, three years or so, I think some, sometimes we've had two per year. And I, what I wanted to do tonight was really just open up for a quick discussion about ideas. And I think um, it's because of the time frame, um, I think what we can do is, what I can do is um, either wait till the next meeting and have a discussion, or I could um, send out 
a, uh, a doodle poll asking people for ideas. I know so far people have talked about um, some type of retreat in some relationship to anti-bias, anti-racism, something, training, discussion, approach. There's been a discussion that was uh, reiterated tonight about the idea of uh, an interest in getting some um, training slash education slash discussion on high stakes testing, um, which might be related to the school and district accountability system. And I actually think there were some other ones. So um, I think just because of the interest of time, if people are okay with the idea, I think maybe I'll just send out a doodle poll see if um, I could generate some ideas and then send that out, ask people to vote. And if there's a consensus, then we could, uh, I'll take the lead in setting up a date and the logistics for that. And one, one of the options, by the way, would be that we don't have one. I mean, that's fine if we don't have one. Obviously people are really busy and we can put it off to the winter or fall. Um, but I wanna hold that out there as well. There's no obligation for us to do. It's mostly around professional development and self-training. Um, self to improve us as a body, our education or our working together. So um, does that seem okay as a plan? Sorry, Mr. Merrick. Member Fallon, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna respond that, um, I know in the past that we did do that where people submitted, submitted up to like their top two ideas and then yeah. if there were duplicates or anything too similar, it was up to you to sort of combine them into one and then we voted on them. And I don't remember if we use ranked choice voting or not, <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's a great way to go about doing this. Thank you. Member Goldman. Um, both of the topics you suggested are pretty substantial and of course there are other topics to discuss. I'm wondering, um, as I gauge the priority, when would be the next opportunity to dive into topics that aren't um, chosen for the 22nd? A winter retreat, you mentioned maybe that then or... Um, yeah, as far as I know, we don't have retreat scheduled, do we, Annie? I think they they've kind of been uh, kind of ad hoc. Um, no, there's no business. retreat scheduled right now. Yeah. So what we do have scheduled are these quarterly student success meetings, and um, we may have in the past. And I was going to ask for the twenty second in lieu of the school improvement plans, but sounds like those are those are going to be done, and we really need to focus on that for October twenty second. So there's really no date. Um, I, I think getting a getting a topic and, and a, a, a sense for best time, maybe I'll just do that in the same poll, uh, best month, if you will, and then um, I can share those results. Either we can have a discussion on it next time, or if it looks like it's really solid and there's a lot of commonality and consensus, then maybe that'll just be the agreement. I don't know really what people's um, time frames are, and, and you know, we've been investing almost weekly meetings at a minimum, so I kind of feel like People don't want to meet too much, but there might be a good solid reason um, with some really interesting and important topics that we've discussed and said we were going to talk about. So I'll approach it that way. Member Gold. Uh, yeah. What was the date of the other one? There's October 22nd, and that's the school, that's the school improvement plan. What's the other date you're looking at? Do we have even a date for the second one you're talking about? No. Okay. So I'll just throw out there, you know. I wouldn't want to, you know, I guess if it's helpful to have the doodle poll, but at the same time, I, I mean, right now, negotiation, folks, we have a meeting on Wednesday next week, on Thursday next week, following Thursday next week, potentially more, more negotiation meetings. So three of the school, you know, we might need to do emergency meetings with school committee, like putting anything else on our docket right now seems like um, might not be the right thing to do as much as I do want to have those discussions. Yeah. I think that'll definitely be one of the options. Maybe it'll be unanimous. Okay, thank you, Member Kaufman. So you'll uh, you'll be back in touch with us with a doodle poll at some point, correct? Correct, thank you. Okay, excellent. So um, that concludes all of the um, regular business of the school committee. Uh, and you'll see the list of future business and meeting dates. And then finally, we have a request for an executive session. Um, if someone would make a motion on that.
Hmm. If someone move wanted to move, move, move to request enter executive session under Massachusetts general law, open meeting chapter 30A, section 21A3 to discuss strategy and preparation for collective bargaining. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. Is there a second? Second. Okay, member Sarah P. Cox, you had your hand up. Oh, sorry. I was just trying to make the motion. Excellent. Okay. Sorry. I didn't see it in time. Um, okay. So I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Member Gold. Uh, yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busanski. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Did Member Condon, are you there? He yes. might. Is he? Oh. Thank you, Sean. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. And Member Voss. Yes. The vote is 10 in favor. I vote yes to. Oh, oh. Did I you? I'm so sorry, Member Levy. It's getting late. Okay, so that's uh, 10 0. So the motion carries. So the school committee will move into executive session now uh, because to have this discussion in open session would be detrimental to our bargaining or litigating position. And we will adjourn from the executive session. So to the members of the public that are watching, um, we will not return to open session. We'll end the recording here and we'll ask that anyone who's not a member of the school committee or staff um, to please uh, leave the meeting at this point and the school committee will go into executive session. So I'll give folks uh, a moment to do that. Um, okay. So there's an Amy Mason on the call still. Hmm. And know. Amy Serio or Serio? Yeah, I see, I saw that. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting out her in the waiting room. I think the and 617 number is Sean, right? Yeah, that one's Sean. Um, yes, it is. Yes, <laughs> okay. So I believe that's everyone else. Um, I fear Amy, the two Amy's may have fallen asleep <laughs> or, or, or lost track that they were logged into the Zoom. I'm not sure. Um, are, we, are you wanting to record this? The recording is on. Yeah, we'll um, typically we don't record.